It's Bron and Kratz from our old studios and AJ in sunny Sarasota, Florida, next to our good friend, Hannah Kaiser. And this is perfect because, hi, Hannah, great to see you. AJ always tries to get me kicked out of the hosting chair, so why not start with uh, <laughs> a person who has actually filled in for me and AJ has put the numbers on the board and said, wow, our show's getting a lot more views and listens today with Hannah on board. I'm, I'm all about it, though. I like it, Hannah. It's awesome to have you and, and be back with all four of us on together. How are you? I'm good. Well, Scott, your job is safe because I have a flight to catch, so I can, can't do the whole two hours. So they're going to have to keep you around at least through today. <laughs> ha ha, AJ. Ha ha. All right. So then let's charge them out and get right Joke's into it. You, so, Hannah. <laughs> hey, I'm happy. I'm here. Um, let's charge them out so Hannah can hit her flight. And we will start with the most relevant news of the past 24 hours. We might go a few shows finally, without talking about Blake Snell after today or tomorrow, because we've spoken about him for like four months, wondering when he's going to sign. So Hannah, when you finally saw that news break yesterday, what did you think? I thought Blake Snell must be like, what more could I possibly do? I turned in a Cy Young season to get what is essentially a one-year deal. I mean, I know it's two years and there's an opt-out, but I just... I, I know that at this point we expected it. It's so late. It's so close to opening day. This is what the other Boris clients took some version of this. But for Snell in particular, you're coming off your second Cy Young season. Don't you think like I've done everything now the agent should be able to turn this into some kind of job security? Hey, watch out. Be careful now because Scott Boris will blackball I, you I, and not oh, ever know. speak to you. <laughs> If you well, say mean things about him, like he didn't get every client $300 million. If that's what he's using as his standard for blackballing people this offseason, there's going to be a lot of reporters he, don't talk, he doesn't talk to anymore. <laughs> because I think people are – I think that's the general consensus. I think, yeah. Yeah, he took an L. He took an L this offseason, AJ, right? We've, we've talked about it. Listen, Scott Boris is the most – If I mean, I don't know. I don't want to say the best because every person thinks their agent is the best, right? But he is the most famous agent. He's the one that everybody, mm-hmm. especially in baseball, when you're talking about baseball, everyone's like, oh, Scott Boris, Scott Boris, Scott Boris. And he has a lot of power in the game. You talk to people, they'll say he's one of the most po- powerful people in baseball because of his client list. And this year, for whatever reason, whether it was the market, whether it was the teams involved, the players involved, he just didn't get the bags that he's used to getting. And nobody knows, seems to know why, but he'll spin it the way he wants to spin it. But Blake Snell signed, sealed, delivered. He'll be in Scottsdale, I'm sure, probably today or tomorrow. And He'll be ready to chuck the ball for the Giants soon. And that gives Three them a years. great one-two for their rotation. Right? So for the Ooh. Giants, if you're a Giants fan, this is incredible news. Yeah, and Hannah, there's reinforcements too along the way for the Giants. I mean, stuff-wise, their rotation is as good as any now, right? Yeah, like you mentioned, you've got the Snell Webb one-two, and Kyle Harrison's got a lot of stuff and kind of can take a lot of pressure off of him. Jordan Hicks is converted to a starter. How about some of the guys that are coming through later on this season? I mean, Robbie Wright won a Cy Young Award a few years back. He might look good in August. Alex Cobb coming back in a couple months. Do you think the Giants are a playoff team now? Are you asking me? Are you asking I do. AJ? I'm asking you. Oh, I answered this last night. Oh, no. What did yeah. you say? I want to. <laughs> I said, I said, I said, well, the Phillies, Braves. The central winner, mm-hmm. and then there's three teams coming out of the West. So it's Dodgers, Diamondbacks, Padres, Giants are the four for three spots. And I think the Giants have just with this signing moved ahead of the Padres. So I think they're going to get in. You're moving. You're you're counting out the Mets entirely. You're like, there's no chance. Pretty much, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're and right. the Marlins. I like that. I do. I think that breakdown makes it look pretty good for the Giants. I, which in some ways makes me think, man, maybe the Mets should have done this because would that have put them in the Giants spot? I think you're right. I think the the rotation for the Giants, it worked for the Rangers last year, this kind of second wave of reinforcement pitchers that they brought in at the deadline. The Rangers are running back that same plan. I think you do have to have this first half rotation, second half rotation, and the first half rotation got better and the second half rotation looks pretty good. I think you're right. I think just the numbers – say the Giants have a pretty good chance of making the postseason. Here's the problem with the Mets, your favorite Mets. They're missing their number one starter for at least until June, if not later. I know. I'm sure you guys talked about this, but I don't know why they didn't go out and sign. Well, they could still sign Montgomery, but when Kodai Sango went down, it's like 
Now what are you doing? Because I like the Luis Severino signing. I like the Shamanaya signing. But even if those break right, you're still missing the top of the rotation. They're taking a step back this year. Uh, They're clear. I mean, if if you're not going in that direction for more pitching, it's not a playoff rotation, you know? The other part, I was looking at comps here, Kratz. Sonny Gray ended up getting more money than Blake Snell. I know it's over three years versus two, but he got $75 million guaranteed three years older than him than the Cy Young winner. You know, I'm just, uh, Ken wrote a great article last night about all the comps and just adding things up. I mean, Lee, who was part of a great off season for the Giants, Solaire, obviously Chapman earlier, you mentioned Hicks, Ray in the trade, but Lee alone, who's going to be in center field for them, the rookie, got what, 3 million less guaranteed than Chapman and Snell combined. Who had that one on their bingo card? Absolutely not. And maybe they overpaid for him. Maybe they were just going all in, like I said last night, on the pitching and defense in a park where it doesn't doesn't really matter. You just have to be able to put the ball in play. Maybe they're going to strike out less this year. And they're like, eh, you know what? We got Solaire. If there's one person on the planet that can hit the ball out of here, we can't pick up. We already tried to pick up Giancarlo Stanton. We didn't get him back in the day. So we'll get Solaire and see what happens. But, I, I mean, they're just – they're doubling down, tripling down, and just like Hannah said, they got a formidable rotation just, just for the fact that not even their accolades. You're going to get Logan Webb slinging it from the right side from here, sinking it. Then the next day you're going to get Snell from the left side over the top downhill plane. Then you're going to get Kyle Harris, or then you'll probably get Jordan Hicks running at 100 in on your hands, and then you're going to go Kyle Harrison. So it's you're not seeing the same look night after night. So it's intriguing to me. It definitely is, and I definitely have them in the playoffs. Yeah, NL West is stacked. Okay, so let's globalize this conversation then, Hannah. Your overall thoughts on how this offseason ended up. I know there's still a few guys left that will sign, but I think we have a pretty good guess that it's going to be sub $100 million contracts. You know, it'll be less than we anticipated for people like Jordan Montgomery and Michael Lorenz seems like players are quite pissed. We've had a few of them on the vets who have kind of unprompted let loose on a terrible free agent experience that they had. I I think we need to understand. Well, Boris, like you said, Boris is going to spin this as a win and maybe all these guys do better when they re-enter the market next year. And Boris has an incredible class of free agents next year. Soto, Bregman, Alonso. So this is no. not, Snell, Snell. This to me is not about like, is Boris bad at his job? You said it. he's a great agent. He is a great agent. I'm really curious as to what the factors were, because I think it is one of two things or two of two things, which is, AJ, you and I are talking about this. The teams that were looking to spend this year maybe weren't the teams that are historically are willing to overspend. So you know, the Mets were taking a step back. The Padres were taking a step back. The Rangers are dealing with the RSN issue. Whatever. Weak excuse. That's a weak excuse, by the I way. I know. But they, that's an excuse. And so I'm curious whether or not it was that or whether or not it's that waiting is no longer a good tactic. That's what I think is really interesting. Because guys did get long-term deals, Yamamoto, Otani, but they got them earlier in the offseason. And in the past, Boris has been able to up the leverage the longer he waits, the Machado-Harper deals that were signed during spring training. And now we're seeing it looks like teams are want to have that, that money that costs certainty earlier. And so maybe the strategy needs to adjust in how you approach the offseason because clearly waiting until right before opening day is not – you're not going to get the teams, even with the pitchers, you're not going to get the teams that panic and overpay because a guy got hurt. So maybe you do have to be more realistic earlier in the off season. And I'm just interested to see how they, how they being agents, but also players kind of adjust to what it is that teams are doing to get themselves that cost certainty. Some of that's probably CBA related too. And I know there was, well, little uprising yesterday that multiple reporters were talking about, right? So yeah. do you think that a lot of what's gone down in the offseason has led to 
players that have votes as part of subcommittees and all that to not get too granular for the audience with the union. Do you think that's why suddenly they're having conversations and talking about, hey, should we make changes on our side? And I'm sure they're already anticipating a nice little battle again and just kind of putting this one in the memory bank for the mm-hmm. next CBA because you know how baseball works. It's legal battles and CBA fights and then everything else. This is the yes. top priority <laughs> always yes. in our sport for some reason. So, all right, we we should be careful how we talk about this because this is a very developing situation. Jeff Passan yes. had the story overnight and then Evan Drellick wrote about it. We've looked into this a little bit that there was an attempted coup, I guess you could say. Is that the right at, word? At the union. Kind of, I guess. Yes. Right? Yeah. I mean, they, they, Bruce Meyer, who was the lead negotiator in the most recent CBA negotiation, they, some players, uh, looked to oust him and it seems replace him with Harry Marino who had headed up the minor leaguers when they organized over the last, you know, half decade, essentially. Okay. So how much of this off season is a CBA issue? I think probably the players who were disgruntled, who were looking to make this change were able to leverage the disappointing deals signed by Boris clients into some level of wider dissatisfaction but I do think that that would be a little bit short-sighted because the, it's tough from a player's union perspective to extract any kind of concessions in these labor negotiations. Just the way that this is, again, trying not to get too granular on the, the sort of labor front, but just the way that sports negotiations tend to play out. Recently, they have really favored the leagues. Leagues know that they have an entire offseason in which they can – uh, enact a lockout, which they did, the owners did last year, and it doesn't hurt their bottom line because there's no games in the offseason anyway, and it puts pl- pressure on the players because free agents can't sign, and then you immediately come to this question of are players willing to sacrifice games, which is going to look bad to the fans. So just the, the from a leverage perspective, the last like two decades have really favored leagues when it's come to these negotiations, and until very, very recently – This most recent CBA negotiation was looking like a win for the players, particularly with their stated goals of getting more money to younger players. That pre-R bonus pool was working. Guys were getting promoted uh, on opening day because of the kind of the incentive package that they put in there with draft pick compensation if your guy goes on to win Rookie of the Year. It looked like they had gotten some significant gains. I think I saw the J.D. Davis sort of kerfuffle was cited. So there are certainly still loopholes and things they should want to address going forward. But I don't think the most recent CBA is in any way to blame for what we're seeing this offseason, which isn't to say players are wrong to be frustrated with how it's played out. I mean, they should certainly try to figure out if there is something happening with teams. Uh, I've, people have alluded to the big C word on this show, I know, but that's not a CBA <laughs> issue necessarily. Agreed. But my, my thing is like the players are pissed, but they, they put the people in charge mm-hmm. of them. Like they chose them. Now all of a sudden they want to switch it up right, right after. And I mean, you said they thought it was a win. So Bruce Meyer was the one that right he negotiated that contract for him basically. And he was the, uh, lack of a better term, Kratzy, he was the hard ass in the room. From he was everything the else. hired gun. I mean, yeah. specifically, they hired him because of how disastrous previous CBA negotiations had gone. They thought we need a seasoned labor professional, someone who has negotiated on behalf of leagues before. And they were happy. I mean, my, my thing, though, is like I read Evan Drellick's article. I didn't read Passons, but so there's 62 executive mm-hmm. committee members now, 38 major leaguers. 34 minor leaguers and Harry Marino was the guy who did the minor league thing. Right. So how much of this is the minor leaguers pushing for something that they don't even really know about from the Bruce Meyer end. Right. Because these used, first of all, the minors used to never have an a a union in in the big leagues. And so it was just separate, but now that they've kind of combined into one, how much is the minor leaguer saying, we don't know this Bruce Meyer guy, but we know Harry Marino. So let's, let's just throw him out and see if he can do better right. without really ever having gone through a negotiate a real negotiation. Yes, I think the what Harry did for the minor leaguers and what the minor leaguers did for themselves was like truly historic. I mean, just generations of baseball players having to put up with horrible minor league conditions to get any kind of unionization which always seemed like 
for years I'd been hearing like that'll never happen. It's too disparate. Guys just want to get promoted. It's a cutthroat industry in the minors. So what they were able to accomplish is huge. But I, I think you're right. It's not the same thing as extracting financial concession from Rob Manfred, Dan Halem, Morgan Seward, the the powers that be at Major League Baseball. The 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 minor leaguers they did this union for themselves. They they agitated, they spoke to the media extensively about how bad things were. They got the government involved in potentially forcing Major League Baseball to pay them more. So that campaign was really successful, but you're right. I think that doesn't necessarily mean the person who headed up that campaign is qualified to lead, you know, these like billion dollar negotiations when it comes to the majors. Is this a AJ versus Eric kind of thing? AJ, a superstar, me kind of more representing the 85 to 90% of big leaguers, not just minor leaguers, but big leaguers too, that never reach AJ status, never reach 10 years. And as a player, I always felt underrepresented because of stuff like you said, Mm -hmm. underrepresented. Nope. Minor leaguers. It's never a thing. I always heard it from the executive board. No, it's never a thing. We've never represented these guys. And this was during all the way up to COVID. And I was like, this has to change because there's things that are going on there. Is this something that Harry has kind of written, like talked to these guys and like banded together the peasants to topple the, the higher ups because when you if you remember when they finally agreed to the CBA, the executive committee, which was represented, the highest executive committee, mm-hmm. which was represented by eight of twelve Boris clients, rejected the CBA, and then the union ended up pushing it through as a whole. But if anything, that speaks to the fact that the rank and file were more satisfied with this most recent CBA negotiation than the highest paid players. I mean, I think it that was a very interesting factor in how this most recent one played out. I think you just have to assume that the guys who are on the executive bargaining committee are probably always going to have the most extreme stance. They're the guys who have taken up this fight very personally. And so, and they are also just higher paid guys. They're veterans, they're stars. Max Scherzer was one of the most prominent of that committee in this most recent negotiation. So their willingness to kind of hold out probably just reflects a more radical labor stance. Whereas the rank and file were like, you got a lot for us in this deal and we don't want to miss games. But if that's the case, those guys, they said they were happy with the deal. They shouldn't now say, actually, we wish we had had a different labor negotiator because I'm sure if they had voted to reject that contract that they eventually accepted, Bruce would have gone along with that and respected that. And he, you know, is more in line with that radical executive committee. So I think the rank and file spoke and they said, we liked the deal you got us in this most recent negotiation. Um, All right, Hannah, let's move to some upcoming work you've got going on. So give us something that you're, you're writing up as you hit the spring training camps that we should look out for pretty soon. Okay, so I'm down here working on some reporting for a story about designated hitters, specifically looking at the way that that role has changed. It used to be we had the big poppies, Edgar Martinez, Nelson Cruz, guys who were true DHs, and the league as a whole has really moved away from that to it being this rotating half-off day And I wanted to look at whether or not that works because a lot of guys who are good at hitting when they're playing the field are not as good at hitting when they're DHing because they just don't like DHing. So I was talking to guys who have done it, who have gotten better at it, who are good at it from the get-go, just sort of about what is the the skill that goes into DHing that maybe uh, fans and executives and people who are like, yeah, you just slot this guy in that day and this other guy in another day. Maybe they don't appreciate the adjustment it takes. And AJ and I were having a lovely conversation about this right before we got on because I was just like, I don't know. I've never played. The numbers say the guys who don't DH as much aren't as good at it. And the guys who DH more are better at it, but it's hard to tell what's the chicken, what's the egg. And I thought you had some really interesting perspective on yeah, it is tough to make that transition. It, it was hard for me. I got I DH'd a few times and 
the hardest part for me was finding something to do mm -hmm. because as a catcher crouch, you can speak to this as a catcher in between your bats, you're on the field, you're involved in everything. And then you're like, Oh shit, I got to go hit. Like I'm up third this inning and you're talking to the pitcher. You're talking to the pitching coach. You're talking to everybody about what's going on in the field. And then all of a sudden you're like, Oh man, I got to hit. And you don't have a lot of time to think about when I was DHing, you have all day to think yeah. about it. It was like too four, much time. It was like four pinch hits. And, and, and I mean, at one point I, I told Hannah this, that, you know, my best, my best way to stay ready was I would have a beer in between my bats. I wish someone had said that to me. Mostly they said, <laughs> you got to hit the bikes. You got to hit yeah. the cage. You got to stay on your feet. Uh, I was talking to Andrew McCutcheon, who had sort of made that transition from position player to almost essentially full-time DH. And he said that he first just started doing it a lot in the COVID season. And he was like, because there was no one there, he would run out in the half innings. He's like, I would run out like I was going to play the field and then just like, you know, stand yeah. in the stands or something just to keep that that rhythm going. Because it is tough. It's tough to make that adjustment. I agree. I couldn't find a routine because it was like, do I hit? Do I go on the bike? Do I run? Do I, what do I do? Do I sit in the dugout like, like with everyone else? And then all of a sudden, man, I got to go hit. It, it just, it, it's a hard, and I agree with what, what you've said is that the guys who find a routine, find a way to do it and become used to it, that's their job. And then right. they don't worry about anything else. They're like, all right, I have four at bats and five at bats. I'm going to use these at bats to the best of my ability. So it, it's a, it, it's a challenge. And I'm interested to see what you found out from all these. Cause I, I saw you talking to Mike Elias yeah. and you're here to interview and he, and he was like, well, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if you're, it. yeah, he wasn't really <laughs> buying it, you know, but then again, he never really had to do it either. So he doesn't understand the difference in, yes. especially like in the minor leagues. I never DH in the minor right. leagues until then you get to the big leagues and they're like, Oh, by the way, you're going to face David Price today is the DH. You're not catching. It's a day game after a night game, but we need your bat. And you're like, Oh, but I'm still tired from catching nine <laughs> innings the night before. Well then, okay. I, I got to ask you, and I want to know you guys opinion too, because I spoke to him for this story. How impressive is it that, Bryce Harper was able to be a great DH having never done it before and being forced into it by injury because he was kind of my like I was like I got to know how you did this because everybody else there's some adjustment period how impressed were you just with, with what he was able to do when he was coming back from injury and DH but didn't play the field and for like days at a you know weeks at a time he had no chance to go out there and play the field and get back into a rhythm I mean, that's, that's impressive, but I, 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 I hesitate to always go to like the superstars because those guys, they, they're, they're on a different level. It's like, they have like this, like, they have this ability that just goes beyond what a regular player who has to grind it out. And that's what I'm interested to see your article is like, where's the, where, where's the GMs, the people who are making these decisions? Like, Hey, we're not going to go out and pay. $8 million for mm -hmm. J.D. Martinez, who has done this for a long time. We're just going to throw Wyatt Langford, Evan Carter, Corey Seager. We're just going to throw, like, Adolis Garcia, all those guys into DH and hope it works out. Like, do they feel like that's going to be the most value for them? And that's where I want to know because I don't think that's it. Because yep. if there's a DH out there who can do it, that is a skill. Just like playing first base is a skill or playing right field is a skill. All right, cool. So then you'll read the article because that's what we're looking yes. into. We're looking into <laughs> what are the factors? Why are teams not paying for it? If teams are not paying for it, then guys don't want to do it because they know they're not going to get paid for it. Like, how how did we get to this place where I think something like 13 teams last year got below average offensive output from the DH position? And there's no reason for that. You should have a good hitter DHing every day. That's the whole job. Yep. I agree. And Hannah, I know you got to catch a flight. We've got uh, Dane, C Dean Kramer, I think, waiting, right? On mm -hmm. the side. Yes. So let's get to him. By too. the way, Great I got to say this yeah. for Hannah. Her outfit matches amazingly in the camera. Blue hat, the hair matches the shirt like perfectly. I know it's not the color she's going for, but it's not. It's faded. It's, it's This it, is it, what spring training sun does to my hair. <laughs> <laughs> It'll look better on opening day, I promise. <laughs> we'll we'll touch up for Tomorrow. opening day. I Tomorrow's love opening day. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Good that's call. True. Hannah, good to see you. Good to see you guys. Thanks. I'm glad to see you. Thanks for out. swinging by. Yes. Safe travels. Hannah Kaiser with us, our good friend to the FT fam. Okay, Bron and Kratz here, and then Dean Kramer is going to join us from Orioles camp in a moment. We'll have some Orioles players, of course, as we make our stop in Sarasota, and the spring training tour for us continues. We'll have another camp next week. Okay, so while we have a moment, Kratz, you brought it up. What are we doing tomorrow morning? early besides oh, watching, watching the game. some ball 
We watched yeah, the ball. After that. And then we're going to talk about watching the ball. And then we got another <laughs> live FT show. Like, we got a post game, post game wrap up for the first game of the year. Like, this is, yeah. this is exciting for me. It's a post game show, just like we did in the postseason. Padres, Dodgers, all to themselves, have Wednesday and Thursday. And then the rest of Major League Baseball begins one week later, officially with the regular season. So, FT has a post game show for you of this whole series. It's powered by MLB Rivals. So myself, Kratz, and AJ will be with us for one of those games too. We will go over everything that we just saw, which not only includes the Padres and Dodgers playing overseas in what should be a wild environment, full of enthusiasm, right? You don't get to see games like that out there in these regular season games. But they also get to see Shohei Otani and Yoshinobu Yamamoto making their Dodger debuts. That is cool. And you Darvish is starting for the Padres. Like, I mean, I know they're they're all Japanese, but there's there's that connection over there in Korea. And I think I think it's awesome. Major League Baseball using the pun, using the pun, knocked it out of the park with this one. I mean, getting those three guys to be able to play in the same in the same two game series here, legit. Yeah, but you know who's the most popular player there by far in this series. JP no? Firehausen. Obviously, it's JP Firehausen. No, but Hassan Kim is a legend out oh. there. And also, I think he's coming off a massively underrated season. The Padres have so much star yes. power last year on that roster. They had the Cy Young winner. You've got Machado, you've got Soto, who eventually gets dealt, Hader, who was hitting a big free agent season, and many more big names, right? And there's Hassan Kim, who is not a 40 homer bat but was a very effective bat last year and one of the best defenders in all of baseball. And now is going to be their shortstop and moves yeah. the veteran Xander Bogarts over to second base. So the Hassan Kim story in general is fascinating, and he is a free agent after this year. And he didn't move just Xander Bogarts. He moved Xander Bogarts, Jake Cronenworth, Manny Machado, Fernando Tatis, and Jerickson Profar, not to mention... Jackson Merrill, all shortstops in the minor leagues. Hassan Kim is that good defensively, and now he gets to be at home to open the season. Yeah, it's going to be awesome. So post-game shows there coming for you tomorrow. And the next day, we're back in Sarasota now with AJ and our first Orioles players guest of the day joining us. It's Dean Kramer. Dean, how you doing, man? Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Thanks for having me on. Of course. Nice, sunshiny Thanks. day in Sarasota. Yes, AJ? Hey, Hannah, Hannah left a hair tie down here yeah, by accident. And Dean was like, is this for me? I was like, yeah, we get, we get gifts. We get gifts for our guests. Show that, show that thing off you got working back there. Look at that. Kratz is so jealous. Wow. Wow. Oh, that should yeah. never be in a ponytail. That is that is an underrated tool. That's like that's like some of the power only bunting. Come on, man. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Dean, have you thought about this? Um, hair can be a good distraction for a pitcher. I've always thought that with Hater and all the hair whipping around, it's just one more thing that's, you know, coming at you, uh, but not really, you know. So do you think there's deception to having long hair in baseball? Funny story, actually. Uh, McCann, he's a great storyteller, um, and he has been for the last couple of years here. Um, he said to Grom the reason why he kept his hair long when he first came up is because one time somebody told him that uh, – that it was deceptive and they couldn't see the, they couldn't see the hand. I think that uh, was behind. me, by the way. Was it? Yeah. Cause we went out, when, <laughs> we went out in New York to get dinner one night and I was like, Oh, for eight off of them. And I was like, I can't hit you because I lose it in your glorious locks. <laughs> and then he started and then he cut it and then I was retired. So I, I hated him yeah. ever since. But the reason why I have it up is, uh, it, it just gets everywhere. Um, and then it just slapped me in the face when I throw. So that's Do the Orioles make you keep it up. No, no, they, no. It was so a, you could it was, go out you yeah, like that and I could, no I could, but I know as, as you easy. Put some blonde, you put a there's a lot. In there. <laughs> we'll see, maybe for playoffs. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what's the feeling from last year? Obviously, you know the team. I would say outperformed statistical expectations, which I know was one of the themes. And and you guys, you know, stormed through the AL East. Obviously, come up short in the playoffs, but this time around, th there are still you know, statistical projections that are like, the Orioles are okay. And I'm looking around and I'm like, they don't even have, they need to create 18 positions to be able to 
please everyone because it's like you have 20 starters on this team, you know? Yeah, we have a we have a lot of de- uh, a lot of depth, especially on the position player side. We've got so many guys that can play the outfield, and then uh, all the guys who play the infield can basically play all three of the positions. Um, so there's there's a lot of depth on the position player side, and and even on the the pitching side. Now um, with starters, we have um, we have Corbin now, and he's another veteran guy that we get to learn from. Um, and then the really, the relievers, uh, with Felix going down and then adding, uh, Kimbrel, um, there's going to be a lot of, uh, good competition, healthy competition, uh, for, for those kinds of spots. So before February 2nd, when you got Burns, did you look at some of the stuff and like, why, why is everybody hating on our, on our starting staff? Like, did you feel, <laughs> did you feel like there was some hate? Because I always, I always tell people like, Oh, we got to trade for this guy at the trade deadline. Well, if you're saying that as a player, you're absolutely spitting in the face of one of your 26 teammates at the current moment. Did you guys feel that way as a starting staff? Uh, I, th- I think we've been undervalued the last couple of years, uh, but we seem to to make it work. Uh, I, we have a really good bullpen behind us, so the deeper we get to go, the easier it makes uh, Hyder's decisions. Um, Where, so, did, has he talked to you about where you're going to slot in? I'm assuming – Corbin's going to be one, and then is it going to be Grayson two? You two, Means two? Because with with Bradish out, obviously at least at the start, have they mentioned like the order you guys are going to go in? Oh, uh, we haven't heard anything yet. Um, still, I think uh, typically they like to make the decisions towards the end of the the last week. Well, so guess what? Yeah, you're about a week we're, out. <laughs> we're pretty close. We're coming up on it, so we should hear within the next couple of days where we all kind of line up. I think they're waiting for. Um, the rest of our outings because i like i throw tomorrow grayson throws today Irvin throws today i think tyler or corbin will be the day after me i think i don't okay, not, I, I saw mike opposition. elias today and he said he just wants to bubble wrap you guys <laughs> put you guys in bubble wrap <laughs> just because every team right now is like please god please god don't let any especially starting pitchers go down yeah, right i know so that, they, do they i always wanted this do they come to you and say hey just just throw 80 percent today just please throw 80 percent today <laughs> don't cover first they bun it. Just let someone else get it. Get out of the way. Yeah. Um. I mean, I had uh, one of the meetings, the the, the first meetings with uh, Hyder and Elias, and I was like, "How you feeling? How's this? How's that? Uh, how's the off season?" Basically, the bottom line was like, "Okay, if you're feeling anything, like please let us know, like, so we can get ahead of it." And, uh, we we want everybody to be healthy. You know, starting pitching is uh, hard to come by in this game now. Guys going deep in the games. It's like talking to kids. Like, hey, if you don't feel well, you have to tell your parents, okay? <laughs> Otherwise, we can't do anything about it. Because <laughs> you're, you're athletes. Hurt, you you guys tell us. <laughs> right? Yeah. Otherwise, yeah. I, I, there's no way for me to know if there's a problem. I have a question for yeah. you, Dean, about development. So there are plenty <laughs> of teams that have tanked over the years, done the whole five, six-year rebuild, blah, 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 right? Many of them have come up very short. The Orioles went through the really, really tough times for a while, and now it's a juggernaut team in my mind. It's it's the top-ranked farm system, and it's what you guys have up in the bigs now too. So what do you see in the development system that shines overall? Like, Because there's clearly differences where other teams are not as effective at just picking guys and then turning them into stars. And I know you've been in the Dodgers org too, so you've, you've seen some success. But what do you think it is? Uh, I think I think it comes down to two things. Um, one, the staff that they've put around us throughout the minor leagues and and throughout uh, the major leagues um, have done quite a job uh, with presenting us with information and and trying to get the best out of our stuff. And, and two, uh, the front office and like the Rays, like the Astros, like the um, the Dodgers, they they find the diamonds in the rough, um, so to speak, where they they see a couple tools. Uh, that guys can possess and and they make the most out of them. What what's what are the tools of the Orioles that they use not only in the minor leagues but at the major league level, right? Because you you hear certain teams are heavy analytics, certain teams are are kind of in the middle, certain teams go less away from that. So do you think that where do you think the Orioles fit in on the scale? And then what are like the the big things that they've talked to you about about hey we're looking for X Y Z? Yeah, uh, I think I think first and foremost what what they've been doing really well is. Um, is finding out your identity as a player. I think that's I don't know you can attest to that. It's like the yeah. the faster you know who you are, the 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 quicker you can uh, progress. And uh, I think they've done a pretty good job in, in trying to find out who 
who each guy is and what they do well and uh, exploiting it as best as possible. Talking about heavy development. analytics? Uh, I, w- I would say we're, we're somewhere in the middle. Uh, Sig and his staff um, do a pretty good job with, with relaying information. And then I think our – I think our, our our hands-on staff, like the big league pitching coaches and and uh, the infield guys and the outfield guys, they're they're good at filtering both the analytics and the real world application because you know it's different. Yeah. Talking about development and injuries, what's more taxing for Dean Kramer? Trying to throw a hundred miles an hour every single pitch, or trying to go eight innings and being like, hey, my whole goal is to eclipse 200 innings this year because I know what value that brings to my team. Um, so last year was my first true full big league season. I mean, Grant, I, like I'm through harder than I ever have uh, last year. And I mean, that takes a toll on you. And then 175 innings, that also takes a toll on you. So this year is definitely going to be a, a, a feeler year and trying to understand how I'm bouncing back from, from that. Cause you know, guys like Burns and Cole and uh, all these guys can, can go to 200 innings and then they bounce back the next season and do it again. So, I mean, that's, that's my goal. Um, in terms of, in terms of velocity or, or innings, I I would say that the innings probably takes a more of a toll, not just the innings, but, uh, I think the amount of starts is what makes the difference. Um, Dean, I've got one more for you. Uh, tons of fans in the chat want to know about Jackson holiday. Is he going to be with the big league club? What's, wow. what's it like to be around him? I mean, he's also he's also the GM, president of baseball ops, and the manager too. Just so you well, know. that's why I figured I would ask him. I mean, hey, I'm a man of the people. They said ask about Jackson Holiday. Give me something that either we don't know about him, or an encounter that you've had with him, or you know maybe a scouting report that you have, a comp. No, I'd say he he's on the quieter side. He takes care of his business. Uh, grew up in the clubhouse, so nothing's really uh, foreign to him. Um, so he fits in quite well, uh, especially with our team, uh, cause we're a bunch of children. So, <laughs> uh, other than that, I mean, he's been, he's been great. It's so funny. So I saw him this morning before they left for Dunedin and he came up to me and I was like, Hey Jackson, how are you? You know, I saw your dad not long ago. And he's like, yeah, cause him and my son and Ethan, when I was in St. Louis were the same. I mean, Jackson's a few years older, but they were in the clubhouse together. And those three ran around like <laughs> all the time. Right, so now just now I'm like, gosh, I'm really freaking old, because yeah. now I'm walked in the clubhouse and Jackson Holiday's like on the verge of making a yeah. big league team, and it's just like, it's just odd to me, and he looks so young in the face. He does, he does. Uh, even uh, I, I would say he even grew up this this off season. Uh, he got a little bigger from the last time I saw him, but even in the face, he looked like he matured a little bit more. He, he might actually have like some chin hair now. Yeah, like a little, a little more peach fuzz. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so I, I do have a question. You, you, you're talking about the 200 inning stuff. Do you do anything in the off season? Like you said, you set a career high last year. Do you bulk up? Do you try to put on some weight? Do you try to do some different, a little bit of a different routine to help you bounce back quicker? Yeah, uh, I've. I mean, I've. I've noticed uh, across the league, the guys who eat the innings are usually like bigger. Um, not just uh, just in stature, they're six foot five, two two thirty. Like, I, unfortunately, I don't have the six foot five, Genetics and I, I think I would roll at two two thirty. Um, but these these guys are also very strong. So I think I, I've made it a point in the off season to to really prioritize the the lifting side, and and the guys over at Push Performance in Arizona have have been great in helping me achieve that. And I I think for me that's that's one of the the bigger things is just being able to put on. Uh, mass and then kind of destroying my body for the rest mass of the eight months. Gas, right? Yep, something like that. Mass equals. You don't need more mass. Look at that hair. You can't. You can't be fat with hair like that. <laughs> fat people don't have nice hair like that. It's like it starts going. It starts falling out. So that would be the issue. <laughs> but what I need from you, we'll let you go. I need one Shlomo Lippitz story from you. Okay, Shlomo from Team Israel. We found out about Shlomo. As the team leader, went from Garrett Stubbs when you guys played in the WBC last year. I don't know if I have any good stories about him, but I, he's he's kind of our ringleader. Um, I mean, I've known him since 2012, 20, uh, 2013. Uh, that's when I that's when I got introduced to all the guys over at Team Israel. Uh, that was my first year with the national team, and uh, when we traveled 
uh, through Europe. We had tournaments during the summer in 14 and 15 before I started pro ball. Um, he was basically our ringleader. We all, we all went through him and, uh, I don't know if you met Nate fish as well, but, um, him too. They're, they're gems of human beings. <laughs> yeah, it was a fun team, man. I can't believe also WBC. It, it feels like five years ago it was last freaking spring training. So a little bit before he wet. goes, I got to ask him about this. The, does that, shouldn't that logo be everywhere? Uh, that's like our second secondary logo i, I know think. that's like, the cool, like an the, interesting one the oriole is so pissed though <laughs> yeah it's, like it's badass it. yeah yeah i think we have that on our bags actually yeah well, well the other like the other oriole the other oriole they used to make fun of the players used to make fun because the other oriole looked like one of their coaches and so they loved that just look it up look up the look it up sometime who, they, who you talking about kirby you talking yeah, about kirby that's a, <laughs> that's, a, that's what Nick Marquez is and <laughs> Machado used to always say. <laughs> I don't think Dean was around when Wayne Kirby was here. <laughs> no, no. Uh, Dean, great to see you, man. Uh, good luck this season. All right, we'll catch you during the year. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. Yeah, great to have you on here. Dean Kramer with us, uh, Orioles starter on FT Live. Kratz and Braun with you again. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, is Wayne Kirby still coaching, by the way. Yeah, he was. Uh, he was the Padres' first base coach. He just followed oh, right, right, right. over there. I think he's still there. He'll find. Damn, he'll I find a spot with all, with all the coaching turnover. Yep. Um. Anyway, while we have a moment here, I do want to just swing back real quick to uh, the Blake Snell deal. So you know, we did a breaking news show last night. We had Ken on. We went over everything that we could. Um, aftermath though, the last layer here that we didn't get to much with Hannah from our prior conversation was Jordan Montgomery, Michael Lorenzen. And I think that I read the top 40 on the athletic still has six players left. <laughs> the season starts tomorrow, tomorrow. My thing when talking to Hannah, just, it made me just it popped in my head like if you are one game out of the playoffs if you're one of these teams that we're talking about that's a fringe team like the cubs or even like the padres diamondback whatever it is these teams that have the financial means and you lose by one game i have a hard time believing you couldn't have found 30 million dollars for Blake Snell you couldn't have found whatever Jordan Montgomery gets. And that's my biggest issue with all this. Collusion, no collusion, you know, driving down, driving down prices of players, Boris, whatever it is. Are all the teams truly trying to put the best team out there, no matter the price? I get it. Everybody has a price. But are they truly trying to compete? And if you missed out on Blake Snell here at the end, Yankees, if you miss out on winning the division by a game, I'm pretty sure Blake Snell would have looked really nice in one of those starts for you. I agree. I mean, AJ, there's going to be some serious regret. There was regret last year about Jordan Montgomery at the trade deadline. I think there were a number of teams that were like, damn it, should have just given up the extra prospect and gotten him. And he shoved in the second half, he shoved in the playoffs. And you do all of this. Everything we're doing here is for winning a World Series. That's what everyone says, if you believe them, aside from some people that are trying to make an extra buck or two, it's about winning the World Series. So Blake Snell, Matt Chapman, and others for, quote, discounted prices compared to what the market usually looks like, it's going to be teams that are like, man, their defense just fell short this year. If only we had an elite third baseman, you know, like let's say you're the Blue Jays, right? Or if you're half the teams that feel like they're a starter short, especially a playoff starter short, this one's going to sting at some point, and we're going to be like, what happened? A lot of teams could use the guy who just walked right in front of the camera, had no awareness at all. Just That's straight, okay. right? I mean, he's kind of good, though, so I can't really get mad at him. And he's bigger he's than me, so I don't even <laughs> want to mess with him. Some guy named Gunner. I don't know. I don't know. All right, so then you he literally just went, whoop. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. It's his world. Yeah, <laughs> right now it pretty much is his world. 
Exactly. About, All right. So give us give us one minute, and then we'll go to Gunner. What's up, EK? What about this? We didn't say this, and we should have. Didn't Farhan say pencils down? Pencils down. Tests over. Off season's over. Twice okay. now. Yeah. Twice but, now. Okay. But, wh- That's All right. A- I'm gonna do. I'm gonna do a quick, quick pat on the back for FT. What did we say? Oh, when absolutely. Farhan says the off season is over, it means they're about to sign someone within a week. It's is that tactic. right or wrong? It's a tactic. Is it really and, a tactic, though? Like, do you have to publicly say that? It doesn't make a difference. You can privately say that. Publicly saying we're done, wh- no. what does it mean? Like now, I for agree. me, like you're still a human being, right? And and you clearly knew that you weren't done. I mean, you spent 50 plus million dollars extra on the payroll in the last week and a half, which is awesome. Love that. Applaud that. But, you know, if I'm just like your friend, I'm like, hey, dude, well, why do you have to lie like that? <laughs> you're not I'll, done. I'll give you my answer. After, after Gunner. I'll give you my answer. Fine. I'm saving it, okay? I'm writing it down so I remember it. Let's go to yep. Orioles camp right now. Gunnar Henderson joining us. Gunnar, what's up, dude? Almost done. A week to go until camp's over. You ready? Oh, yeah. Looking forward to it. Uh, looking forward to getting the season started. Where are you guys open? Uh, we're at home, actually, this oh, year. Oh, against? Uh, the Angels. Oh, all right. Yeah. Rack up some wins early. <laughs> <laughs> when do you start preparing for the pitchers that you're going to face? Because it's different where you've got like too much time to prepare for a test and you probably will have an idea of who those three pitchers are if you don't already. Yeah, for me, I'll probably just wait until we get closer to, I guess, those off days before the season starts and uh, not try to look too much into it. Just try to treat it as a, a normal game in the season and uh, just go out there and try to get some good at bats. Do you are you a big prep guy? Are you a video guy? Are you a chart guy? Are you a watch your bats off a guy? What what what? Because I was more of a, like I looked at count charts and I look at a little stuff here and there on video, but everyone approaches their bats differently. So what what's your approach to prepping for a pitcher? Yeah, um, I'll obviously look at his plots to see uh, how his pitches are moving. I'll watch. We'll have some video rolling in our uh, hitters meetings, so I get to see what exactly that he's going to throw and how it's moving, and um, then I'll try and get in the cage and. Uh, we'll make the shape of the uh, little foam ball. I was going to say, you're, close you to, guys have the foam balls, that, yeah. like the fastball, like if it rides at a certain angle, you can make it Yeah, pretty much the same, right? Yeah, so uh, I do like to hit the little hoppy foam balls. They'll literally rise, and uh, it helps helps me, and um, it kind of resembles a couple pitchers in the league, so I really enjoy hitting those. Plus, and, they don't hurt your hands. Exactly. That's so when you get jammed, thing. you're like, oh, I didn't yep. feel that one. I don't <laughs> break you my don't phone. break your bat either. <laughs> <laughs> you're you're – you're, you know, not a rookie anymore, but you're still young in your career. Is spring training too long? Uh, for me, it wasn't too bad this year because I had um, a little oblique at the beginning of it. So mine was about half the spring training game. So I'm feeling pretty good right now. It's about perfect timing. So, uh, yeah, honestly, you could cut out the first week or week and a half and uh, still be plenty ready for the games. Like a Which, vet. Uh, like it was a vet. actually the left side throwing. Oh, yeah. Oof. Yeah, but he's you, fine now. I remember I remember when it happened, and, and I don't think it was these guys. It was some of our guys were like, oh, man, oblique, that sucks. That really, like, hits you. And you're like, nah, sorry about it. I'm early 20s. It'll be a freaking distant memory in two weeks. Is that how you feel? Yeah, I mean, I did it long tossing, so it uh, it never felt it swinging or anything. So that was the biggest biggest thing for me is just uh, getting back and getting that uh, side ready for throwing. But um, it wasn't too bad and too long out, so that – I guess that helps. When you did it, did you just go down? Because I remember when I did mine, I was like, I played with it like a fool. But like <laughs> a lot of guys, a lot of guys do it, and they just go down like in a heap. My, you know, I'm just, it's like my rib cage kind of crunched down on it a little bit, so it just kind of caught on me, and I was like, oh, well, that didn't feel good. <laughs> that, but uh, wasn't supposed it to wasn't, feel like that when I threw yeah, that ball. Yeah, it uh, it wasn't too bad to where I had to fall on the ground. <laughs> so are you excited? Because Scott wants to know, and all our fans want to know, are you excited about moving? away from shortstop so Jackson Holiday can be on the team on opening day? <laughs> I don't know if I'll be able to let that happen. I enjoy, I enjoy shortstop. So, uh, yeah. I, yes. No. No, no, no. I love that question because I had wrote the same question down, and this is the this is the prodding because you're always going to get the question from Scott Braun, like, how neat is it? How is Jackson doing? And I want to say, no, like, you should have you should have made a prank or you should have, like, introduced him to the – spring training clubhouse and been like hey circle the circle of the second base you ain't taking my job is there any kind of ribbing like that from you guys 
No, it's uh, no, it's all fine. Um, I mean, he's doing really well. Uh, he's getting reps at both, but uh, he is adjusting really well at second base, and uh, it's really fun to watch him go out there. Is this uh, the first time I've really got to watch him consistently, and it's uh, cool seeing him out there. So is it going to be Henderson Holiday double play combo then? It's going to be like you're going to, you know? Yeah, I got to get that. Got to get the reps together. <laughs> okay, all right. Have you guys played together yet? We played twice okay. this spring. So. Okay, and then you notice you're talking about him being a vet. There's a bunch of dudes back there taking abs off uh, Grayson. Guess who's not taking abs off of Grayson today? <laughs> That's a good break day, you know. Hey, I'll do live BPs tomorrow. I'll play in a game tomorrow, right? Yeah, good work day today, so we'll uh, keep it light. <laughs> hey, off, um, yes, actually, on that topic. Yesterday. Got yeah. off day yesterday, skipping the live BP night game. I think four night games in a row yeah. here for the Orioles. So, wow. I mean, they are in mid – they're getting to midseason form now. <laughs> yeah, I'm That's prime that scheduling. Now. Yeah, but Gunner, I think that's prime scheduling. They didn't always do that, but having the night games heading into the season when it's mostly going to be night games, do you like the way that they set it up? Yeah, because last year I think we had a bunch of day games in a row before uh, the season, so I'm enjoy we're going to enjoy having the uh, night games right before we get there so we can get in that schedule early. Uh, on the topic of not facing Grayson Rodriguez, um, C. Mills wants to know who is the most difficult pitcher that you've faced so far in your young big league career? Um, that's a good question. Um, I'll go, I'll go reliever. I got to face class A this year a couple times and, uh, it seems like that cutter is almost impossible to hit. It is very tough to hit. <laughs> Make any pass? Good one. Uh, no, but it felt like I did. <laughs> My thumbs hurt. Uh, well, Kratz, you never got to face Mariano, right? And I know Gunner did it, but so Mariano cut was one time on a rehab him? assignment didn't count. Uh, <laughs> true. So I got to face him a lot, and uh, I, I would at, by the end after about I was I got to hit my first about I threw one over the shortstop's head, and then I broke a bat every a bat after that. So I would I got to a point where I would just grab a teammate's bat and I'd be like, I'm taking your bat up there <laughs> because I know this is gonna break. Sure enough, and I'd hit it about six feet and he'd come up, pick it up, or strike me out. But yeah, I mean that's how I imagine what Claus A feels like is he he's throwing it a hundred and it's just going. Nah, 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 yeah. nah, 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 nah. It's tough. <laughs> hey, Gunnar, um, some fans are asking about Kobe Mayo, and I'll actually extend it. You can give me your little scouting report on him, but also who is your favorite Orioles prospect? My favorite Orioles prospect? Um, well, that's a, that's a good question right there. I like – they're all really good dudes. It's hard to just pick one. You can, you can uh, name a couple or, like, who's the prospect yeah, of the minute that really stood out. Yeah, uh, I mean, Kobe's obviously been tearing it up. Um, actually, yesterday, two days ago, John Rhodes hit two homers in back-to-back -back at bats. That was pretty sweet. Um, he's he's really got a really good swing on him. Uh, I mean, obviously, Jackson's been tearing it up. He's looking really good at uh, big league camp. And then uh, one more we'll give you. Uh, I'll say, well, I guess Colton Cowser's still a prospect. He, yeah. Um, so, uh, yeah, he's been swinging it really well. Dude, that Mayo guy's gigantic, by yeah, the way. I saw a, him in the locker room. I was like, whoa. Huge dude, yeah. Yeah, I didn't realize they made him that big anymore. But, yeah, I mean, he's, he's a – yeah. you, you get him and then you get Holiday, and you're like, wait, which yeah, one's and he's, the – Yeah, and he's starting to fill out. So, But, yeah, but Holiday still looks like he's 12. <laughs> so, you're like, wait, which one? Which one's the super prospect? I mean, they, I know they're both super prospects. Yeah. Do you do anything fun this winter? This winter? We talked to you when you were in your truck, so – yeah, uh, did a lot of hunting with uh, my dog, and then um, I guess the biggest news is I got engaged this off season. Oh, so, yeah! So that congratulations! Was, thank you, thank you. Congratulations! And I mean, I'm gonna ask this because Kratz and Scott don't never hunted in their life. Did you get any? Did you get anything? Oh yeah, we uh, we killed a lot of ducks this year. Um, no deer. I saw one towards the end that I was wanting to kill with my bow, but of course he only came out in the um, the, sh the hunt stand. So. Didn't, didn't get a shot off at him. But, right. uh, but you know it's turkey season right now. Yeah. Here. Uh, I, I, know, I, I need to get out. I'm going out this weekend. So uh, oh, are you? Yeah. Osceola's are sweet. Yeah. Sweet. I'm going to try and plan to get a trip next year okay. somewhere. Well, I, I'd, I'd offer to take you, but you guys are busy in spring training, so it's a little <laughs> bit far. I get, we have some land over yeah. across the state. Oh, sweet. Yeah. Yeah. So, and did, did people recognize you more now that you know you're rookie, Mr. Rookie of the Year? Uh, When we're – uh, in like downtown Siesta, just grabbing a bite to eat. They'll 
to say like congrats and stuff, but uh, it's all it's all cool. Um, it just depends on the crowd we're hanging out with. So, uh, like, do you guys all go out together? Uh, it'll it'll kind of be because we have a house with five of us right now. Oh, so, well, uh, who's uh, now now who's in this house? Because this is so it's um, uh, Adley, uh, Kowser, Stowie, uh, Cal Stowers, um, and Ryan Mountcastle, and then myself. So it's uh, what goes on in that house. house. What? Is this, uh, is this an early uh, early to bed, early to rise house, or is this a late to bed, late to rise? No, we've uh we've actually had a pretty good schedule. We're we're all in bed usually by about ten o'clock, and um, but before that we'll we'll usually get into some fishing. Uh, the we have a little dock right on the uh, Siesta Key Channel, so uh, we have a little tally board for how many fish we've caught. And, um, I'm well in the lead of that right now. <laughs> oh, hey. Bragging rights. Yeah, bragging rights for the house. <laughs> Who gets <laughs> video games Who? too? No, uh, it's mainly mainly DoorDash. <laughs> <laughs> no one's cooking. <laughs> do you guys do do you got what's what's more intimidating? Facing the opening day starter for the Angels or planning the proposal to your fiance? Um well I will say I had it kind of – it wasn't as bad because r- the week before or, like, a couple days before, I had to uh, make that speech in New York. So I was uh, a little bit more nervous for that, and it kind of settled the nerves for the engagement, to be honest with you. Uh, that was my first true public speech because I didn't go to college and didn't have to do it. So, uh, yeah, that was – it kind of eased the um, the nerves a little bit for the engagement. You, you, you did, did the whole cool? knee, right? Yeah. That's, that's the death? I did. Uh, yeah, it was about uh, two weeks before that, or probably three, maybe. I don't know. It was a couple weeks before I had to do, go to New York, and then uh, the engagement was that next Friday. So. Uh, like, I, like, crowds want to know: Did you do something cool? Did you like take her somewhere, and then take her like somewhere special, and get down on the knee? So we did it in a neighbor's backyard, just kind of some uh, history there, and uh, we were able to get both families there. We, uh, long story short, we had a uh, photographer that's in our, in our hometown, and we got her to convince, I guess us, which I already knew what was happening, but uh, that she needed me for some photo shoots, and she was going to get my now fiance in the pictures with me, and then uh, we had it set up where she handed me the ring, and we got it, uh, got it staged that way. Nice, pro, pro. Well, congratulations, Gunner. I mean, what a freaking year! What a past year, and now. I'll go get the city a chip, right? So uh, good talking to you, dude, and um, good luck this season. We'll catch you during the year. Over to the frat house. <laughs> I want to come over to the frat house. Yeah. Dude, you need AJ to go over there. You know, he'll he'll I mean, cook I... you guys up a storm. Oh, there we go. I, I can cook. Yeah. I can cook, okay. dude. Don't, don't act like I can't cook now. He's never you cooked. You go days, hunting. So you don't, don't hunt. You didn't get anything last time <laughs> you went hunting. Don't talk about hunting like you're some like outdoorsman, cooksman now. Uh, yeah. Kratz, when I go to you, I've had some good meals. At AJ's, I bring my own food. But hey, maybe maybe he's a better cook for Gunnar Henderson and Adley Rutschman. Oh and, yeah, you, you definitely know, don't have enough service time. There's definitely. I mean, the big just, boys. yeah, just Never like we talked to. about Richie yesterday. Richie Palacios. Mm-hmm. Oh, Richie didn't. I didn't see you on the list. I was only looking at the top. The top four guys, Randy and Yandy. I was tired, though. Yeah, right. He was just looking at the one side. Hey, which side of the locker room has all the vets on it? I know how he works. Yep, exactly. Very well stated. Um, all right, let's get to, first off, the reminder that you told me about our combo before we had our little interview here. Farhan Zaidi is, by multiple accounts, from the Giants, from other GMs, from every, people over at the Dodgers, even people back, shoot, I think he was with the A's before. He is a fantasy football legend. And it's all about him and the way he can leverage people to get the players that he wants. Not necessarily just a draft pick. He leverages guys in trades. And so maybe that's what he did with Boris. Yeah, he uses hypnosis fantasy too. football uses. Hypnosis, right? You'll be on the phone with him, and then all of a sudden, you traded away your top running back. You're like, I don't even know what happened. I fell asleep. Uh, I got, I I got, woke up I got three gone. tight ends for my top running back. Seems like a good <laughs> deal. 
<laughs> is this a is this a three tight end league? No. Okay. All right. While we have a moment, let's do our bet MGM futures division winners is the next category that we're going to hit day after day. And I swear this was planned a while ago. I was like, on March the nineteenth, let's do the NL West. There's an FT calendar to prove it that is out there somewhere. So here we go. Your bet MGM futures NL West odds. Still feature the Dodgers at minus 550. Then you've got the Giants at plus 1,000, the Diamondbacks at plus 1,100. Same with the Rockies, or sorry, the Padres. The Rockies are at plus 20,000. Anybody want to be a little daring and give me a team that is not from Los Angeles? Anyone? Anyone? Can I raise my hand? Any chance that what? The Angels are from Los Angeles. Angels aren't in the NL West, and the Angels are <laughs> finishing in fourth place. So, any chance that everything comes together for the Giants and they shock the world and they keep up with the Dodgers or the Diamondbacks, I guess, or the Padres? Like, do you think there's any chance that this next quote tier can win the division, or it's not even worth messing with this because minus five fifty is so aggressive, and then the rest of them don't just have a ch- just don't have a chance? Like, how are you sizing you want- this up? I actually think there's a chance for the Giants and the Diamondbacks, obviously. I, I think the Padres are still a little short, but yeah. I, I think there is a chance if the Dodgers pitchers can't stay healthy. That's the, the, the one chance is Bobby Miller doesn't take the next step. If Glass now gets hurt, he seems to get hurt a lot, and we love Tyler Glass now. But if Kershaw doesn't come back strong, right, if something goes wrong on their pitching staff, that is the chance. Or – what was it, 2022? Miracles can't happen, and the Giants somehow win 107 games out of nowhere. And I, I, but I, I mean, it's just such, there's so many things that have to go right for the Giants because, like, they're going to need Ray to come back healthy, Cobb to come back, Harrison to pitch better than he did last year. It's it's there's a lot of ifs, and but the Dodgers have the least amount of ifs. I don't see it no. as a way. I don't see it as a way. I mean, Gavin Stone's named as the fifth starter right now. Like, the Dodgers have way more depth. I'm not saying that the Giants aren't a good team, that the Diamondbacks are not a good team. I just think a a Matt Chapman injury away, like, there goes a lot of your defense. Son of the wind injury away in center field. Do you have somebody that can play center field in the big leagues? The Dodgers have just stacks on stacks. They're starting a team that – wants to absolutely rake. But they have defensive, versatile players in Kike Hernandez, Chris Taylor. They just have more above-average big league depth than some teams have above-average above minor league depth. And I just don't see – I don't see it happening. And I, love, I think that number is so funny, though. Minus 550. How do you touch That's, that? That is a lot. Yeah. That is a lot. You can't, right? You don't. No. Is it a lot? For the for the yeah. West, yes. I feel like minus five fifty gets so aggressive. It's like could have the injury bug hit even a, a position player or two. I know there's depth, but if a superstar or two goes down, I don't know. You still think with all I that, think baked you have in, three or four or five of them. I know, That's right. I know. I'm I'm just trying to I'm trying to talk myself into something sexy at the four figure range. You know, um, maybe for San Francisco. Patrick Bailey finds the bat. Maybe Marco Luciano is a stud right from the jump, like has a breakout season because he was a big prospect for years and can handle yep. the position eventually. I know, you know, they brought in Nick Ahmed to kind of push push him a little bit and make sure that the defense was tight, but maybe Conforto bounces back, guys like that. I don't know. It will be a colossal collapse with a monumental just – Everybody doing what you just said. I think, I think Bailey is a player. I think he is super athletic. He's not even t- coming close to the value that Will Smith is going to give. Like every every position, if if Mookie, if let's say Gavin Lux doesn't hit, they move Mookie back to second base. They put a near Gold Glove shortstop in the position. Nick Ahmed was a Gold Glover. It's been a few years. Like, he just got released last year. Like, you have Chris Taylor that could that could come in 
and fill in for the Dodgers. You have Kike Hernandez that can fill in for the Dodgers. Like the Giants' depth is why I don't see how they could overtake the Dodgers because injuries will happen. It's funny also, I always look down at the chat when we're talking about the NL West and people are like, well, it's neat and fun to go to Rockies games. It's a really fun experience. I'm like, I agree. <laughs> it yeah, is absolutely. fun. It yeah, is they, have, they have a cool mascot. They have Dinger. Yes. Yeah, they do. And Kratz had a great line the other day. He was like, the Rockies forgot about the Rockies. <laughs> they did. <laughs> like, they keep the lights on. It's amazing. That That is – it's sad because that place is electric when around the park, in the park, when the team is good. And it's like mm-hmm. they've just kind of stayed status quo. It's such a good division now, too. It's so tough. Yeah. <laughs> They're looking around going, how do we even compete? Yeah. yeah. True. Hey, here's one question if you want to go all conspiracy theory. What if the World Series features two wild card teams again and changes aren't made? I think eventually there's a point where teams are like, you know what, actually, there's too much history now. There's years of this. No. Screw it. I'm going to finish in the wild card. Tim, teams well, don't. Stupid. It's a loser. Teams don't do that. Scott. That's why you didn't play. There's I'm not no... saying they're losing on purpose. I'm just saying it might be a you better just said, seat. Screw it. We're going for the wild card. Yeah. <laughs> That's, That's losing on mentality. purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Well, teams can do that with their transactions. We've seen that quite a bit this offseason. There's plenty of teams that have been, you know, what did nobody uh... what did Nick Kroll say? We're not here to be yeah. competitive. That's a losing mentality. Scott Braun's new mentality is we're going for the wild card. That's a losing mentality. I like Nick, Kr- Nick Kroll's winning mentality. I just think there's a lot of like, um, flaccid throttle attempts this off season. When you get when you get a player to come on here and say in September, let's say September twenty fifth, and say, "Man, I wish we didn't have these five days coming up here off." I, I really, I really don't need these five days off. If you if you get a player to come on here and say that, then I will change my tone and be like, "Hey, you know what? Maybe you should go for the wild card." Brian Snicker almost said he would take he player? the games. Is he a player? Uh, he's not a player coach. Last he got a I shirt yesterday, that. though. He got a shirt. He, he got, got a foul there. Shirt. shirt. All right, Delivered so to the player. dugout by myself. And by the way, we've had kerfuffle and flaccid used today. Uh, as a secret words on foul territory. People don't realize that we actually get words sent to us before each show and we have to use them. So I just looked down at my piece of paper and said, this is the perfect time to use that word since many GMs operated that way. Anyway, (laughs) your first bet offer at 1500 bucks back in bonus bets is on if you use the bonus code foul and you download the app, sign up and deposit at least 10 bucks into that account and place your first wager and receive up to $1,500 back in bonus bets if the bet loses. And if that happens, your bonus bets will be available once your initial wager is settled. And North Carolina, the spotlight is still all over you. Bet 5, get 150 is on just for you when you place your first wager through the app of at least $5 in the state of North Carolina. You'll receive $150 instantly in the bonus bets, regardless of your wager's outcome. Got to use the bonus code FOUL. Gambling problem or concern? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Oh, that's a good call. I saw what you did there, Kratz. Our locks for game one, we did not get to that yet. So we'll see. How about we'll post those in the morning and then we can go over them in the post-game show. Did you already have yours prepared? Post them before before the game? I got to wake up before the game? Like six in the morning? We can get them together this evening and then you can By the way, I'm getting attacked by bugs. Good. What the hell is that? Did you not bring bug Who spray? Was that? was that a damn caterpillar? What the fuck? It's dropping off the tree. Caterp- Dude, bring that thing back over here, Higgins. You're... The size of this thing was just on my neck. I'm gonna need I'm gonna need workman's comp. Don't be scared, Higgins. You were in the freezer the other day. Put it on the ball. <laughs> <laughs> Can you guys see this? Uh... Look, at this. look at this. Look at that thing that was just on my neck. Oh. I need hazard pay. Definitely fell out of the tree. Yeah, no kidding. Then it crawled down my shirt. Hey, give the Orioles Higgins, their ball back too, Higgins by the way. Scared Don't be of it over there. Baseballs. <laughs> Higgins is scared. Higgins, our intern, was in the cooler the other day because he heat exhaustion. 
<laughs> That's because Claudia didn't go to Fort Myers to yeah to help him out to babysit him. Yep. Now I got now I got caterpillars falling down my shirt. AJ should just be a Florida coach. You should actually travel around with the ice box and be like, I'm going to teach you how to Florida. <laughs> <laughs> just dragging the ice box behind his it Sounds like a, a family guy episode. This is how you Florida. <laughs> Bugs uh. will attack. Heat will prevail. <laughs> uh, all right, let's get to that's what he said while, while we still have AJ. Um, <laughs> did, did you guys see this from the weekend? So... It seems as if Sammy Sosa is trying to kind of get himself back into baseball a little bit, into the public sphere, just kind of live life and um, be a part of Chicago baseball. And, of course, he's, like, refreshing the public again. And what do you think he gets asked about pretty quickly? Let's run the Q&A that he had with the media. Is it time for you and Tom Rickus to sit down to get back into their good graces? Well, like I say, you know, I'm a mature man. Uh, I, th I, you know, I think that uh, it's a possibility that we can do that. I'm open. I don't have a problem with that. Um, you know, I have, like I say, I have a lot of misunderstanding in the past, but now I'm a, I'm, I'm a real man. I feel great, so I recognize my mistake. So hey, why not? Are you telling me that you recognize the fact that maybe you did do steroids? Um, <laughs> this is, um, like I say. Um, this is um, um, not a question that I expect from you. I've never heard AJ say that in a QA and a because you were very available, AJ. That's why you're doing the show, too. I mean, you were a media darling. Did you ever say, I was not expecting this question from you? No, I just said that was a clown question, bro. <laughs> uh, you should have no, said that. Uh, what did you I think? Was it a clown question? Show. I used to actually do the show on Fox 32 every uh, Sunday night. I'd go into the studio and do a do a show with them. So I, I know those people well. Listen, they, they asked a question. All you got to do is say, I don't want to talk about that or no comment or I didn't do steroids. If you didn't do steroids, it's a simple answer. You don't have to say, like, I wouldn't expect that question from you. Because guess what? When you're Sammy Sosa and no one's talked to you for, like, 10 years, they're going to ask every question they get the opportunity to. So just be like, yeah, I didn't do steroids because I didn't do steroids. Yeah, I'm – Kratz, or you know, if you did, then either say, "Yeah, sorry about it. I did it." Remember, we had Mark McGuire on Legends, you know, months back, and he was like, "Let's just talk about it." Or, yes, like AJ said, you just no comment. That I think the way that he did it was uh, not not well trained. I uh, I love the answer. I did not expect that question from you. I love. <laughs> I was coming here to just make up, but I like how the reporter was like, yeah, you're trying to like tie things up with the rickets and everything. You know, it all kind of stemmed from the fact that he was pissed. He didn't get a contract and then he walked out on his last game. He didn't feel like he was, he was treated very well. It really had nothing to do with steroids. It's not like the ownership was like, we're never bringing this guy back. Steroid user. We've never had a steroid user with the Cubs. That is not at all what it was, but the, but the reporter was just like, now it's time to talk about steroids. Like, I don't know what kind of answer he was expecting out of old Sammy there, but it's good no, to see it, him again. He does look It reminded me of, of another funny situation, but let's table it for a sec and let's go to our next guest from O's Camp. John Means joining us right now in Sarasota. John, what do you have, man? How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, dude, thanks for stopping by. by the way. He's Is yoked, it? dude. These guys are all yoked in this Orioles camp. I know, all these guys are so big. I feel like we have to have one of the bigger pitching staffs. Like you look at like Batista, Cano, like uh who was the guy? Uh, Tyler T Taylor uh, Wells. Wells. Oh my Wells, gosh. Bauman. All those yeah. Baker. Yeah. The whole guy. What about Danny guys. Coleman? Oh, Kramer. D D oh, Danny Coolum? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He kind of helps the uh, yeah. He, Is he the potster? Yeah, for sure. Because he's I my was, roommate right now. I was in there for he's, like 30 minutes today, and he was in everybody's business. He went from guy to guy. Hey, this guy said this, and this guy said this. and this. You hear he was talking shit about this guy? I mean, he was like this the whole time, just stirring it up with every guy in there. Yeah. he. If, if I give up a homer, he's the first one to let me know, like, <laughs> hey, you shouldn't have thrown that pitch. What every about when time. he gives up a homer? Every time. And I, I give it right back. But okay, he good. doesn't give up many. So. Well, here, if you're playing, I don't know. If, I don't think Scott's ever been to Ed Smith. The wind blows out here. 
40 miles an hour every single day. And yes. it goes dead out to center. Mm -hmm. Ask Jake I Fox. Did. Jake Fox had like 15 home runs one spring training. <laughs> yeah, I just right, saw like, Malik go next... deep on the backfield. Did he go deep off of uh, off of uh, Grayson? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And they're best friends, so it is it's so funny. Uh Mount pimped it pretty good pretty well. Did uh I just gonna know did Nick O'Hearn get a hit? Because I guess Grayson was talking mad trash to O'Hearn before his at bats. Uh I don't did he face him? I don't even know if he faced oh, him. Oh, because he said I didn't see him at bat. Okay, because because Nick was over here on the little field and he said, oh, I get to face Grayson, he's been talking, so I'm locked in <laughs> to getting it hit today. Grayson loves talking, loves talking oh. <laughs> talking smack, but it, sometimes he gets thrown right back in his face. <laughs> All right, let's let's do the uh the housekeeping where are we at on the recovery scale yeah feeling really good right now uh through my second line bp the other day and i have a couple more and then right into rehab starts so it's going well recovering well and uh hopefully be back real soon do you have a timetable yeah i shouldn't say time do you have a goal in it, or it, which would mean a timetable, really. Yeah, hopefully late April. Hopefully late April will be back and just, you know, hit the ground running. No restrictions? Mm, nope, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, feeling good. Yeah, should be good to go. What, what, uh, excited. I, it, no, no, I was going to say, as a, as a big leaguer, obviously, and guy that's had success at this level, it's got to just eat you alive, right? Because your guys are all out here grinding, and you're out there, you know, then you go, they're like, oh, you're, John's going to throw, but he's throwing on field eight over there. <laughs> You yeah. got to walk. You got you try to take the walk, and you got your bag, and you're like dragging it over there, you know. And everyone's mm -hmm. like, "Oh, we got the big crowd today," and everyone, yeah. And then you're like, "Oh, I'm so sorry." Yeah, and I'm facing. Yeah, these guys I don't feel <laughs> for it for sure. Uh, no, and this is the second spring training like that. Last year I was rehabbing Tommy John, and then I got another kind of rehab here. So yeah, I I would love a normal spring training one of these one of these times. But uh, yeah, it just motivates you a little bit more, especially when the team's this good and. You're watching these guys go out there. I think what's our record this spring? Like eighteen and five or something. Is that crazy. what you guys are? It's insane. You know yeah. what that means? It's, <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing at all. You sound like Eric Kratz right now because he's <laughs> talking about all the homers he hit in spring training, and I'm like Kratz, those don't count, dude. Yeah, you never want to waste them that early. No, but no, yeah. I love watching. I did have to waste them that early. That was my game. That was my <laughs> season. My mom watched those games. Okay. So those those homers mattered. <laughs> Did you ever I think, think my spring training ERA is like a seven and a half? Like I, I get absolutely shelled in spring training. And my my rehab starts, same thing. Like if I'm in double A, I get absolutely shelled. And it's like, all right, well, hopefully this works when I get up top and and sometimes it does. Did you ever think when you were, you know, first, second year, when you're an all star for this organization, that you'd be coming into your free agent year going wow, we got a shot at winning a World Series. Or were you like, I got to just keep my head down. We got some brutal teams here. I'm the best player on this team. Here we go. Yeah, I mean, you, you saw how they were rebuilding, and you saw, like, it was definitely from the ground up. Like, we were trading for prospects. We were doing all our due diligence on trying to create, like, the the place in the Dominican and be more international and, and get these young guys. And then now the – you know, the cream is rise to the top and, and now you kind of see it. And because I saw like Gunnar Henderson, I met in, when he was in high A and he shook my hand. I'm like, that's not a typical 19 year old handshake. Like that's uh, a legit dude. So I, I think I, I knew uh, it was coming and I was hoping that I'd be, you know, healthy for when it happened and haven't been. So I've just been looking forward to trying to get back there and, and, and help the team out while, while, while they're so good and it's it's going to be good for a while i mean these guys in the minor leagues i mean i think we have do we have the number one minor league system again I i'm think. sure yes like it's 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 insane i mean mike's done such a great job with it all and 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 i knew when first time i met him like this guy's really really freaking smart john do you walk around sometimes to the young guys and go you don't even know you don't even know what we went through <laughs> <laughs> yeah there's like nobody left from from like 19 there's a, there's a few guys like me hazy Cedric Santander, but but these guys have no idea. Like the, I, we, I talk about the 19 game losing streak we went on in 21, and the, I'm like, you don't have any idea what that feels like. <laughs> I mean, you go in on game 15, you come into the clubhouse, it's like, all right, just please let it end today. Let it end, please let it end today. And then somehow we'll like lose on a, you know, walk off single or something. And it's like, Jesus Christ, like, come on. <laughs> I gotta know because I never went crouch. I don't think ever Kratz ever went through anything like that. But when you're coming to the park, 
what was it like? And then when you guys finally broke it, was it like you guys won the World Series? Was there like a big party? In yeah, the I mean, I think we saged the clubhouse at like 18. So <laughs> 17 or 18, we, we went full sage. Uh, Mancini went around, you know, the outfield, the batter's box, the pitcher's mound. Uh, we went full sage, and I think we broke it that night or the next night. And, uh, and yeah, I mean, it was just really – I think we did party a little bit after <laughs> after the night. <laughs> or the – after we finally broke it but no it that was it was miserable and it was it, and i think that was like we had like a 10 game losing streak that same year and it was like come on like it nah, yeah it i hope to never feel that again yeah and some guys in your org might never feel that it reminds me of certain dodger players i think like cody bellinger's first few years were all like world series ish kind of years and i think jock peterson went years without ever not being on a playoff team. So some of these guys might go through that. At the time, John, were you guys at least like, well, we're big leaguers. This is cool. We might be good eventually. Like, how, how is it at the time? Because I know from a media member perspective, when we're asking questions, we can't, now we can joke about it. But when it's when it's mm-hmm. going on at that time, guys are just like, oh, we, we got to find it, whatever. And you know, like, this is not a good team. It's not a playoff team yet. Yeah. Yeah, because you're still in the big leagues, right? This is like your dream job. Like you're at the top level and you're you're like this should be fun. And it it, it sometimes it wasn't. I mean, I, I talked to some guys getting sent down and sometimes it was like kind of a relief to like I mean, because they're everybody was kind of struggling. It was like they'd uh they get sent down. It's like finally I get some time to like figure some stuff out and like less of a microscope. Um but it's yeah, it, it's definitely not your typical big league experience and it's um I mean, it's just, yeah, it, it wears on you a little bit for sure. And it's, it was just a carousel of guys coming through, you know, how it goes and, you know, AAA back, you know, guys have families. And so it's just, yeah, it's a struggle all around. Yeah. You did throw a no hitter though. What year was that? It was 21 when we, 21. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. When we won on the 19 game losing. Like, was it right game. after that? No, I think, I think it was before. It was like right before. <laughs> okay. So you yeah. threw the no hitter, then you went on a, so it's your fault. Yeah. Cause if you would just Probably. let a guy get a hit. Then the, all those 19 games, you might have won one after like seven or eight, right? Yeah, that, I, I think it is my would you, fault. You I wouldn't trade it's... that though, probably, would you? <laughs> I don't know, probably not. Yeah, I, mean, I wouldn't. I would. Probably not. That was in 2007. Mark Burley threw a no hitter, and then we went. Everybody got hurt, and we blamed Burley the whole year. This was like in April. We're like, it's your fault. You just would have given up a hit. We would have been much hit. better. Yeah, that's right. You just quit being selfish. Do Do you when you were going through a no hitter when you're you're pitching? Do you know what's happening? Did you know, did um, you, since we were on the road, I did, you know, because they kind of let you know, like, by the fourth or fifth inning, like. Who let you know? Like, the fans and, oh, the, like, okay. be yelling it and, and that sort of thing. Uh, so, I knew, like, fourth or fifth, like, I'd hear someone scream it from the crowd. I'm like, oh, okay, I guess I do. And then just kept going and, yeah. When you got, so, what inning did you look up at the score? You're like, because I know you peeked a, l- a look and you're like, oh, shit, we're in the seventh. We're in, we're in the eighth and there's still a zero. Yeah. I, I mean, in the seventh inning is when you flip the lineup over for the third time. And so, like. They're, those top three guys were really good. They like Hanniger, Seeger, and uh, Ty France. And I'm like, okay, if I can get past these three guys, you know, I got I got a chance. Uh, and I think I got a call against uh, Hanniger that was like a foot inside for strike three. It was like a battle of account, and it was like this far inside. And he rung him up. I'm like, thank God. No, I think I, <laughs> all right, maybe because <laughs> he had I think like 40 homers that year. It was crazy. Yeah, that was his good year. Yeah, yeah, he's yeah he's a good hitter. Um, but, but no, it felt it a little bit in the fifth and then just kind of, I knew in the seventh, I could get past that, have a chance. There's a big, I don't know if you can hear me through the earpiece. I'll let you put the earpiece back in. There's a big, there's a big talk now, you know, Ken Rosenthal wrote an article with Ina Saris about pitcher injuries. You're coming off a pitching injury. They put so many things in that article about like, Extra velo- chasing velocity, chasing velocity on power changeups, chasing this, smaller guys. Well, you're a huge guy. You don't throw 100. You like, are injuries to pitchers inevitable and we're making too big of a deal out of it because guys are just going to always want to chase? Or do you think there's an answer? Yeah, I don't, I don't know what the answer is. You know, obviously being hurt, you try and figure out what, what the difference is. I think that. I mean, we're chasing now as pitchers. Like we can, we see every pitch and what it moves like. And now we're chasing, you know, twenty inches this way, twenty inches that way, twenty inches this way, and manipulating a little bit. I think probably too much. And so, I mean, it, back in the day when you didn't see what every pitch moved like, I think you just kind of threw it was natural to you, and, and 
you're like, okay, this is what I got. So I'm going to work with this. I mean, there was some pitch development, but not to the you know aspect of uh, what we're doing now. And I think that has a lot to do with it. And obviously velo is king. Like, I mean, we're seeing it every year. The velo goes up uh, uh, across the league. And so I, I think that is obviously not probably the best for your elbow or shoulder. So I, I think there's a lot of different factors that go into it. And, and just, I, but I think the main one is probably the, the fact that we're trying to just chase all the unicorn pitches we can possibly get. We just had me and Dean on and I asked him, did you guys feel as a pitching staff a little bit disrespected before February 2nd? Like they were always going, oh man, if the O's could just get some starting pitching and you guys are sitting here like, wait a minute, like wh- what about us? What about my career 370 RA? What about Grayson Rodriguez? What about Kyle Bradis? Did you guys feel under appreciated um i mean i mean we're used to it here in baltimore uh, you know just the, <laughs> it comes with the division and it comes with you know the low payroll um but i i just think that we have a lot of talented guys here i mean grayson you know is sitting 99 uh 100 some games and and bradish was what fifth in the al cy young last year like we have some legit arms and and a lot coming too. Like, I mean, I think we have a lot of young guys that are thirsty to prove themselves as well. So, I mean, I think at the end of the day, like, and obviously, Bernsey's going to help us out a lot. And you know, you you get that arm like that in your clubhouse, and you're you're pretty jacked up about it. So, um, no, I I think we're going to be just fine. You know, obviously, time will tell, but uh, we try not to listen too much. We, we, I mean, like I said, we're we're used to the. Um, you know, underperformance that stuff. Did you, you mentioned it. So I'm going to ask, cause I did see Mike Elias earlier, talk to him a little bit. You mentioned the payroll. I mean, do you guys, do you guys ever thought about like forming a, like a revolt and going up there and being like, dude, sign some of us, like lock some of us up, like yourself, Adley, Gunner. I mean, there's a whole Grayson, right? There's a whole slew of you guys, Bradish, Dean Kramer, like that have done a lot of things for this organization. Like you said, from going from, awful to winning the division last year and having a great shot at it this year. I mean, have you guys ever thought about like, you know, pitchforks and going up there with your bats and being like, Hey, sign some of us to keep us here long-term up the payroll. Yeah. I mean, I think it's coming. I think it has to, you know, I, I think that we have a young team and, and we're really, really good right now. Like we hundred one over hundred games last year. I mean, I, I think that it's coming. I think there's some transition happening. So, uh, we're hoping in the near future that you see guys like Adley and Gunner and those guys. Like you can say you, yourself too. Nah, You've been here for a while. Yeah, I know. But uh, but those guys, I mean, they should be staples in Baltimore, right? I mean, those guys. I mean, you don't want to get rid of at you know those types of players. All right, be- best place before we let you go. Best place to eat in Baltimore. Best place to eat in Baltimore. Uh, let's see. <sighs> I'm trying to think. Um. LP steamers. They have some of the best crabs and uh, where is that in the? Clams. Is that like in the city? It's in in, in like uh, Locust Point area. Okay. Um, yeah, it's where kind of everybody lives around, and they, and they got some good good crab. Okay, you're a crab guy. I are am. But the or, problem is, my a... wife is allergic to shellfish, oh. so it's like I like crab. I, lo- I do. I do like the cakes. I don't like working for the meat. But I don't it's like, so fun that like it's fu- yeah, it's it's more work than it is, what you get still, out like, of it. So we I used to like. get, when we used to come in as visitors, yeah. we, we'd always get like, we'd stay in the Hilton sometimes right yeah. there attached to the ballpark. And we get a big conference room and a big table. We get a bunch of them for Fred, the visiting clubhouse guy. And mm-hmm. we just lay them out. We get a bunch of beer delivered to the room. And we yeah. just, it was like a, a night out. Yeah. But you're sitting in the yeah. hotel yeah. and you're yeah. looking you over Camden of, yards. Cra- yeah. And you I, just sit there and talk and beat the crap out of the crabs. So you had Fred as you, of course we had Fred. Yeah, he's the best. Now he's the home guy. I know, it's he's crazy. the best. Um, Kratz had Fred. Fred and George. George oh, was in there cooking oh, the George yeah. Foreman. Yep. Yeah. Oh, man, the best. No, Freddie, I I just want to give a shout, Freddie. He is the best. <laughs> like, I, that guy is that guy is key to uh, us winning. We we get him over and we start winning. Um, but, no, I, I do like it. It's it's eventful. I just don't like working that much for the okay. meat I get. But okay. that's fair. I love those crab cakes. I mean, I could eat uh, true. 10 of them. It's oh, true. Crab cocktail, underrated as well. Don't have to work for it. Just throwing it out there. It's more of like your steakhouse vibes, but underrated. You're it's a little more fancy for, for yeah, me. Thank yeah, you, thank yeah. you. Yeah, the the rest of us, me. yeah, the rest of us don't do that stuff. Sorry We're about busy. it. Sorry about it. And I have been to that ballpark, AJ. John, good to see you, dude. Uh, appreciate <laughs> the time, man. Good luck this season. We'll catch you during the year too, all right? All right. Sounds good. Thanks for having me on, guys. 
Thank you. John Means with us on FT Live. <sighs> that was fun. I have been to that ballpark actually quite a few times for a little spring training action. Back in the the old Manny Machado, Adam Jones days. Dan I used to go watch, to go watch games there when it was Melvin. Melvin, uh, shoot. It was like Miguel Tejada. Melvin. No, what was the, the dude that freaking... He raked. It was Miguel Tejada and a- AJ would remember. Anyway, I used to come home. I used to come home from my minor league season and my minor league players card would get me and someone else into a game, two free tickets. And so we'd go up to Camden Yards. My wife and I would go up to Camden Yards and we'd go to a game. And so it was, all I'm thinking is Melvin Mora. Is it Melvin Mora? Yes, it's Melvin Mora. Melvin Mora was like a... Yes. 300, 130 guy. He was smashing baseballs. I liked Melvin Moore. Good player. Underrated player. Didn't Melvin, didn't Melvin Moore have like quintuplets or something? Yeah, he had yeah. all the kids at one time. Yeah, yeah, he had like five kids at once. I don't know if it was didn't five. Guy, but... Nice fella, too. Nice fella. Yeah, raked. Um, all right, let's get back to that's what he said. So just to put a bow on the... Sammy Sosa combo. For some reason, this came up in my head, Kratz. Do you remember Matt Harvey's interview on the Dan Patrick show when he yeah. was talking about Qualcomm? I'm only <laughs> I'm here, here to talk Qualcomm. about Qualcomm. And Dan Patrick's like, look, kid, this isn't how it goes, but you <laughs> just do you. He was like, he was injured at the it's time, good. right? Did you get any hits? Uh, yeah, I think he was asking about TJ, and he was like, Dan, I'm here to support Qualcomm. And he's like, I know, but there also is an interview. You do that, and then we'll mention your sponsor that brought you on yes. to the show. So yes. for some reason, that just that sparked it for me, where you just <laughs> don't know how to handle a media situation that's pretty simple, but you get frozen, right? It's like freezing at the free throw line. I thought, I thought Dan Patrick handled that really well. And I also wanted to say, I didn't get to re- retort the best place to eat in Baltimore, and I'm a breakfast guy, Blue Moon Cafe. I didn't know if it was called Cafe or not. It's down the street from the Four Seasons where we would stay in Baltimore. It is this little hole in the wall, and they have Captain Crunch pan- uh, Captain Crunch pancakes. I think it's pancakes, not waffles. But anyway, they absolutely smack the best. Blue Moon Cafe, that's the best place to eat. I'm looking them up. It's French toast. French toast. Thank you. Oh, Captain Country French toast. Oh, looks so fantastic. Um, next guest that'll join us in a sec is Ryan O'Hearn. So if you have questions for him, we will take them and we will ask a few of them as we've been doing throughout the day here. Awesome. Really just a fantastic day in Sarasota for AJ besides the attack of the caterpillar. Um, it's it's a sunny day. You've got the O's in a good mood. You know they're basically undefeated in camp. Like, they've got too many freaking good prospects. It's, it's good times out there right now. They have, day, so, they have night games. They have they, night yeah, games you're, you're getting to the night game in. schedule. They they've got it going on right now. They do. All right, so let's go back out there to our next guest joining us on FT. It is Ryan O'Hearn from the Baltimore Orioles. Ryan, good to see you. And guess what, dude? So I want to start out this way. I I Googled your name as we're getting going, right? Because I usually like to pull up stats or whatever, right? Do you know if you Google your name, what one of the top photos are? Like not even on the images section of Google, but just like it has a couple profile photos, just, of you know, like a headshot of you on KC, Baltimore. Then there's one on the right side here. Do you know what it is? No, no idea. I'll I'll do it for you. And these guys will make fun of me. It's you just like, like this. (laughs) Here, hold on. Right on the Google page. Hold on. We'll see if AJ can pull it up. Might as well, because sometimes, like, you'd you just be surprised when you Google yourself. Obviously, this is a no, good problem. Sometimes, like, you have a friend where you're like, dude, did you get arrested 10 years ago? Because I Googled you, and you're popping up all over some county page. There. Oh, there. that it pops one. Up for you. You got it? That. Yeah, we got it. Where he's, he's showing off the guns like this? Yeah. I mean, I had a glimpse at it for a second, and yeah. I, I think the biceps look pretty big. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I love Damn. that. I love that. That's great. 
You look like one of your pitchers on that. I mean, all your I asked them to here. tighten up my sleeves a little bit. So, but yeah, but this year you can't do that because they're you not can't custom- customize anything. <laughs> yeah, you have to see you know, Taylor or something. Uh, uh, how's, how's everything Ryan going? Just, a week to go. Yeah, it's yeah, not good for him. No, not it, good. It's good. It's good. Uh, I just faced G Rod in a live, and um, mm-hmm. he's talking trash. He told me to bring two bats, but uh, got out of there with one. Only needed one. Um, so I feel good about that and I'll take that as a win. Did you, he walked him. So did you pimp your walk? Uh, a little bit. Yeah. Did I just like, looked back at him, stared bat, at him. Bat flip him and yeah, you're he, scared of me. Yeah. He knows who daddy is. That's right. <laughs> Dude, how much how, how is the... Go ahead, uh, G-Rod has been trash talking for weeks now against his own teammates. And I think he's just getting in mid season form. Uh, it's just kind of how he goes. So, uh, makes the lives pretty fun. What's the dynamic during live BP for people that don't know? Are some guys super, super serious? Because I know you're trying to kind of simulate game mode. And are some guys like G-Rod where they're like, yo, rookie can't handle this? I would say for the most part, the pitchers take it very seriously. And the hitters are just kind of like taking it seriously, but there's some trash talk going on. Uh, G-Rod is is a little bit uh of an outlier he likes to talk trash constantly 24 7 which in um for him either works out really good or really bad so uh today i'm gonna take the win uh mounty took him deep so put that on the record and um yeah can, so can he take it though because like a lot of guys that talk like that they can't take it when you dish it's like when mount castle when he hit the home run today he had to like bat flip and like Walk like really did, yeah. slow and do the whole deal, right? Yeah, well, we watched the entire ball flight. It hit the top of the wall, so it was a little bit of a wall scraper. But, um, yeah, Mounty was still standing in the batter's box when the ball went over the wall. So definitely some pimping going on. Does he ever talk smack? Does Does G-Rod ever talk smack to the opposing team? Like, is he that guy in the dugout that's just chirping the whole time? Yeah, he chirps a little bit. Um, I just think that's in his nature. And you know what? Personally, I love that. Uh, you got to have that guy in the dugout kind of keeping things um, fun. And um, obviously we're trying to beat the shit out of the other team and the other pitcher. So uh, if G-Rod wants to lead the charge, then I'm all for it. He's a big dude too. Big boy. Yeah. I got to ask this Uh, since you guys, we're no, we're talking starting pitching. We're at the Orioles. They kind of invented the the dugout celebrations. Do you guys have one planned? Because I know Gibson was here last year. And you guys had the sprinkler and you had the, the Homer hose and all that stuff. Is there something that we need to look out for? Because weren't the Orioles the first ones with the big chain, right? Mm-hmm. Like I was not ago? here, but a couple years ago, yeah, they had yeah. the big O's chain. Seems like every every team has something nowadays. Yeah. So you have to have something. Um, I don't I don't know of anything in the works right now. We got a little bit of time to figure it out, but um, we'll get something going. I don't think you can run back the. Um, the dong bong or the sprinkler. I feel like that happened organically and we just kind of have to let that go and start up, you know, something new. All right. Do you guys have a team meeting for that? Are you going to call it like maybe a meeting an unofficial say, team meeting? Say we're going to meet at Siesta key. I don't know. Or like some restaurant say we're going to come up with our Homer celebration tonight. Um, no, there are no plans for that. I'm sure we'll do a team dinner or two before the season gets going. And I think that's maybe where uh, it'll get started. We got a lot of creative guys. The pitchers are especially are very creative. So as we saw last year, so um, yeah, I'm sure we'll come up with something good. They have a lot of free time. Too much free time. <laughs> um, For sure, Ryan. On your side, getting a lot of fan questions here in the chat, asking about you know the classic question that you probably got asked the most all of last year. Actually, you can you can let me know while I ask it. You know, hey, what what was the difference from KC to Baltimore and? You know, what led to this new you? So what is the answer to that question? And was that your top question in 2023? Yes, definitely my top question in, in 2023. And um, it's a valid question, you know, it's because there were some lean years there in Kansas City for me, no doubt about that. But, uh, you know, sometimes it takes a change of scenery. And, um, you know, I got some to work with some really good hitting coaches over here. Um, you know, get an opportunity to play more consistently. And, you know, when you start to have some success and you get to keep playing and keep going, things can kind of snowball. But um, I would say overall, it's just a accumulation of a lot of things. Um, and, you know, 
obviously enjoy my time in Kansas City, but um, you know, really having fun here in Baltimore and it's such a good atmosphere, such a good um, you know, vibe in, in camp this year and and um, you know, and, and the organization as a whole. And I think it's just uh it's just a good good place to hit, good place to uh you know, drive runs in and you, you got so many good players around you, it makes it easy to kind of pass the baton and, and just keep the lineup going and uh, you know, score runs. Ryan, did you know about the bird bath last year? Because some fans asking about that yeah, too. I just think he's popping out. The bird bath. Did you know about the bird bath last year? Oh yeah. Section. The bird bath. I got to play left field a few times last year, so I got to see the the bird bath up close. Um, I don't know if they're going to have the bird bath in April because it's it's probably going to be cold, <laughs> and uh, I wouldn't want to be sitting out there soaking wet in the cold. But uh, I think Mr. Splash is back, which is the um, our a mascot of sort, I, I would say. He's he's going to be out there spraying people with water. So uh, the bird bath is great. Uh, brings the vibes, and and uh, you know when the offense gets rolling and people are out there doing the sprinkler, shooting water around, uh, it makes for a really fun atmosphere. It could be the cold plunge, AJ. Cold plunge section yeah. for AJ. Yeah. We could, we could they, rename it the cold plunge. They could say if it's cold enough, like when he squirts the water out, if it freezes before it hits you, <laughs> you know the temperature. Yeah. They could just chuck ice at people's faces. It would be awesome. <laughs> they could just chuck ice at people's faces. Awesome. <laughs> you must have been a waiver, though. <laughs> Wait, no, 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 no. So, uh, you were here. Was, you were here. Adam Jones was a coach. Can you, you? Adam Jones obviously is in the foul territory family. Yeah. Can you rate him as a coach? Was he a good coach? Bad coach? Yelly coach? Stay out of the way coach? Not just look cool in the uniform and you know the coach in the dugout and the games happen. He's like pointing to the checking crowd. around. Yeah, yeah, I mean, when you got that kind of star power around here, it's I think you just got to show up and be Adam Jones, you know, because everybody loves Adam Jones, obviously the fans. And, uh, you know, us players, it's always fun to have him back and, and get some time around him. But, um, you know, I've been playing a little bit of outfield, and obviously he's pretty good at did outfield. Did he teach you anything? Yeah, he did. He did. did? We were working out and uh, on some, you know, some reads out there in right field and, uh, you know, just trying to pick his brain. And um, I will never be as good as Adam Jones in the outfield. <laughs> I fully understand that. But – um, if I can, uh, you know, get a little bit better from him, then, uh, that's awesome. What, what did he teach you? Uh, we were talking about just kind of around the wall, like some awareness around the wall. Um, and then the line, line drives like right over your head. It seems to be like some, for some reason that play is just always hard, like a line drive, hard hit right at you. So it's, it's like, I don't know which way to turn. So he's just kind of helping me like understand, especially in right field, which way your body should turn automatically. Um, that was kind of the main thing he was helping me with. For me, for me it's left okay. because the ball's either going to cut this way off a righty or it's going to hook from a lefty. Have, so. you, you, have you seen Zoolander? Yes. So are you an ambi turner? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I'm still working my blue steel out in the right field. <laughs> okay. But <laughs> DHing. You got 12 DHs last year. Hannah Kaiser's yeah. talking about she's, – she's formulating an article about how teams – are not getting a ton of production out of their DH position because teams value it as like, oh, yeah, you know what? We'll just have Ryan O'Hearn DH. We'll just have Adley Rutschman DH when he's not catching. Does that suck for you? And don't give me the whole, like, oh, I just want to get in the lineup. I'll do whatever it takes. <laughs> like, is that is that the toughest position to hit, or do you like it? And you can see yourself being a fat DH one day. If I'm a fat DH one day, it means that I will have hit a lot of homers and yeah. I will have great numbers and probably a bunch of money. So I would uh, be okay with that one day. But currently, I like to play the field. I feel like uh, I like to split time at first with Mountie, get some time out in right field. Um, you know, if I can DH every now and then, it's always nice on the, on the body. But yeah, you're right. That seems to be the way to go. Unless you got like a you know Nelson Cruz or JD Martinez. Or, I don't, is Nelson Cruz? He's probably not. Is he still playing? No, he finally retired. He retired. Yeah. Are but, you calling uh, them fat? What's that? Are you calling them fat? No, I'm calling him rich and really good. Would you say AJ's but, uh, fat? No, not at all. Dude, just, what do you mean? He's shredded. I'm not shredded, but I'm, I'm, not, shredded. I'm also not fat. Yeah, but AJ's uh, like thick. He'll run you over. It's you know you, that, that we got these two, the two catchers. They played back in the day when. The, the game was a contact sport, so guys would smash into each other. So you needed these big boys, Kratz and AJ. I, I know that. they don't really do that anymore. I'm sure the catchers don't. You guys miss are that. soft now. We are soft. I, are you kidding me? I love that was like my favorite play. <laughs> I love that. Like, dude is coming, 
and yes. I am going to take this guy on, and I am going to make him out. And it was so pissed when the guy would be safe because I'm like, I just got run over. So the whole key was like, I'm catching this ball, and I am going to make you out, and you're going to hurt me, and I'm going to go flying, and I'm going to look stupid, but you're going to be out, and then I'm going to talk shit to you yeah. after you're out. I just remember the play when Pudge Rodriguez just yeah, absorbs we, a hit and he's got the ball like yeah, this. See? So badass. We can't do you can't yeah. do that anymore. Did AJ just say anymore. he was gonna make out with the runner twice? Yes, he did. He make did out. say, no, he said, I'm gonna make out. out. That's what you said. I'm, I'm gonna making make out. out. Yeah, uh, making out. That's what you said. Oh uh, well, I mean, hey, whatever works. <laughs> AJ you. wanted to collide with a oh. guy and make out with as him. long as they're out, I don't care what they have to yeah, do. Yeah, he's just trying to get dubs. Sorry about it. Watching these two play growing up, it was like AJ was always the villain. Like, I always thought AJ was a villain as a kid. And I thought Kratz was, like, you know, like the nicest catcher ever. And then when I come on your show, Kratz is always asking me the hard questions. And, and AJ is super nice. So maybe I got it all wrong. See? So, so, okay. So, listen. That reminds me. He goes, he goes, you're not going to ask me Salvi or Adley, are you? Maybe and I go, pick- no, that's a Kratz question. That's not something I would ask. Yeah, I'm sorry. That was all. That's yeah, all yeah. And then he said, so then we're talking, and he, he was – he was over here on the little field doing his pregame stuff. And I said, and I asked, you know, Ryan, we come on. He's like, yeah, but I got to go face Grayson. And he goes, you know, what, what would you say? I go, I understand if you say no, because you're working. And he goes, what would you say? And I would say, I, I would say yes. And he goes, but that's not your reputation. I'm like, well, I always did the stuff in the media. I just was mean to the other team. Like I would tell them to fuck off. I'd never tell my own team to fuck off. <laughs> that point. is true. That is true. You know, you make time later. AJ was actually a legend for that. And that's why he's doing all this stuff too, Ryan, is he was very available. He was one of the most available players always. He was, he was good with that. It, obviously, we appreciate that. And also, I was like, for as much for teams to sign me. I was always cut, so I was available <laughs> for other teams to pick me up. That's, that's my availability. <laughs> <You're available too. laughs> I was always getting fired. <laughs> fired and rehired. Yep. Yeah. I could see Kratz in the clubhouse where, you know, it's a really bad loss and th- there might have been something bad that happened too. Like there was a fight or something and, and Kratz is so nice. He's like raising his hand to the reporters like, you can come talk to me. I'll, I'll help you out. I'll give you a quote. I'll give you the tea. Yeah. 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 There, was, there was one game we lost one time and like everybody was down and I hadn't played for like five days. And I just walked, and everyone was just down, and there's bummed. And I was like, man, you guys really suck at baseball. And it just got everybody back up because they knew I wasn't good enough to play, and we were losing, so it really didn't matter. <laughs> That's funny. Team guy. Team guy. All right, so b- before we let you jump, do we, do we have another guest in vision, in view? Another what? Another Is guest. there another – Orioles player in in your purview at the moment? Yeah. My favorite player in the game. Um, Scouting report? Who do you got? Very strong. Hits a lot of homers. He went deep today, I believe. He did go deep Cedric Mullins? Cedric Mullins? Yeah! Close. Close. Cedric Mullins and Ryan Mountcastle look very similar to each other. Cody Ashey. Is it Cody (laughs) Ashey? Cody Ashey. Never Cody (laughs) Ashey. It's not Cody Ashey. I get one more guess. I get one more guess. Okay, wait, wait, Kratz, wait, wait, before you do it, um, I don't know if this is the right game, but c- can you do, like, what's the Pictionary kind of game where you have to tell them something, but it's not the name? You know what I'm saying? Charades. 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 Or, Reacted out. Charades, I guess. Yeah, act it out. So, so Ryan, can you act out yeah, the okay. last name for I'll the player? I'll be him batting. This is me in the box, right-handed. So he gets in the box, and he's just being all goofy, and then when he – he leads back. He and then he gets locked in. <laughs> ah, and then, yeah. whack. <laughs> it's Ryan Mountcastle. Yeah, good stretch. James McCann. Right James McCann. <laughs> James McCann's in there icing after having to catch six innings of grace in today. Oh, yeah, he's, he's in the hero. ice box. But, all right. Thanks for having me, guys. No problem. Ryan, right. awesome to have you. Appreciate you, dude. This was fun. Thank you. See ya. See ya. Ryan O'Hearn with us and Ryan Mountcastle uh, will be with us in just a sec. We'll go from ryan to ryan that was good that was good that was actually more creative than i thought it was going to be i thought he was going to be like like this like i'm a mountain and then you know where does a a king and queen live a good batting stance imitation by your teammates sometimes gets in your head but other times like kyle higashioka used to always do his his imitation of my of my batting stance and it was like really slow and everything was like really slow. And then he'd always swing at a slider down and away. 
but you get that it gets in your head. So we'll have to ask Ryan, even though he's even though he's on well Mountcastle, even though he's on a high from hitting a dinger in live BP. Did that get in his head a little bit? And is he going to have to change his stance because his platoon partner O'Hearn imitated him? Yes. I can't wait for that post-game interview. The post-live VP interview is going to be fantastic. By the way, are you good at recognizing batting stances? Yeah. Oh, I love it. Really? I, I feel like I am. I feel like I am because I watched so much baseball, and I watched so much baseball when I played, whether it was a game or scatter reports. I feel like I'm pretty good at that. Okay, I ask this for a reason. We might be doing a little game related to guessing batting stances this week on one of our FT shows. Just a little clue for everyone to think about. A little clue to digest. I think I know what you're talking about. I think you know what I'm talking about too, but we've got a plan with a special guest. So we'll get to that pretty soon. All right, agenda here. We'll talk to Ryan Mountcastle, then we'll do slap hands and be on our way to another day. We'll try and get a little bit of rest because everyone needs to be up at 5 a.m. tomorrow. And if you're pre-gaming, you might have to be up at 4 a.m., you know? I think I'm getting up at 5.30, get a little breakfast, Mm -hmm. strolling down to a quiet part of the house so I don't wake anybody else up. You don't think anyone else is going to wake up to watch ball with you? And there it is below us right now, the FT Live Soul Series postgame show powered by MLB Rivals. Right after Dodgers Padres, we will be live bright and early. But for now, let's get back to our next and last guest of the day. I'm going to simulate the regular season because that's what live BP is all about. Okay. So Ryan Mountcastle is joining us right now on the post game show after that epic home run off of Grayson Rodriguez. (laughs) <laughs> I'll be like every reporter on the field. Ryan, yeah. what was going through your head? And take me through that at bat. I was just trying to get a good pitch to hit. You know what I mean? And uh, <laughs> 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 no, he, uh, I think it was like a one-two count. He threw a slider and uh, left it over the plate. And it's more like a line drive. And it actually it hit the top of the wall and went like almost parachuted even further over the wall. It was pretty cool. Pimp. And how'd you pimp it? Yeah. Yeah. Let's talk about the pimp job. Are there rumors about what happened there, with the pimp job? There, there are rumors yeah. that you might have done a couple things, yes. <laughs> so Grayson likes to talk a little bit. And uh, he after I hit it, I was like looking at it. I was like, hopefully it goes out. And it goes out and just gave him the double bird. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa, yes. <laughs> and, what did, and what did he do? Uh, he was like, that's a, he said it was a Mickey Mouse home run. So, I mean. Oh. Yeah. oh. Tell him wow. when you go to arbitration, yeah. it still counts. It still counts. It still counts. <laughs> one day there's going to be a doc. It'll be like, you know, what was the Jordan doc? What was that one called that everyone watched? Last, Last dance. Yeah. Last dance, right? It'll be like first dance since, since most of the team is like 10 years old. And they'll be exactly. like, and there was this one fight in live BP <laughs> on March yeah. 18th. Ryan Mountcastle yeah. against Grayson Rodriguez, and they yeah. show the footage. Somehow the footage pops up. I'm sure someone was taking footage, and they're like, look, they hated each other. Uh, yeah, they hated each other. <laughs> there's definitely there's definitely footage. There's definitely a camera in center field. There's probably slow motion edgetronic. Uh, you need to blow that up with uh, you just to... double birding him right here. Yeah. Just, yeah. yep. Yeah. I love it. Need but a lot of BPs are always fun. It's fun to, you know – talk about how does guys. grayson talk trash though he's a pitcher i don't know they all do it though it's like once i face you in spring you know it's you're done for and you hit it off them and it's you know never good enough I is guess. anyone thrown at you this spring uh i don't think so i hope not um i we had a kid named hunter harvey back in the day he probably would throw at me on purpose but besides that that's it because because we have corbin burns on all the time and yeah him and rowdy Teles have a little thing yeah and every brewer Ex brewer like Corbin's like, oh, when I face you in Pittsburgh, first one. Yeah, right every there sing, is. every single guy in Rowdy is like, I'm hitting you, I'm hitting you, I'm hitting yeah. you, I'm hitting you. Yep. So I, uh, it's good. At least they're on your own team, exactly. so they're not throwing at you. Yes, I, I love that. Love that. Grayson's only <laughs> Grayson's only real comeback could have been well, that that probably wouldn't have been out because you hit it to left, right? Yeah, like left center. Yeah, that probably wouldn't have been out in Camden Yards because they moved the fence out. back. Yeah, I mean it. It, it wouldn't have been. 
<laughs> doesn't matter. Well, it was a homer it here. Doesn't matter. Doesn't Counts matter. Here. It was a homer, it's and it's matters. on film. <laughs> he was the first one to conquer it, I think, ever. Right in a real game, Mount Baltimore. Yes, yes. It, it took. I feel like it took like a month. Then finally, I just sort of <laughs> hit like a hanging curveball out, and like I'm sprinting around the bases, and I think I hit it like you know four twenty five or something. But you still have to sprint that one out at Camden Yards. Do you think it's history. a big reason? <laughs> yeah, but do you think it's a big reason why? the pitching philosophy has changed in Baltimore. I mean, for years, everyone's like, oh man, you got to go to Baltimore. That sucks. And you're in the AL East. And, you know, now all of a sudden, obviously it's talent related too, but the Orioles can pitch. It seems like probably it's an easier sales pitch to free agents Mm -hmm. too, to be like, hey, come on over. We have a massive, massive left center field. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I know every time somebody gets to first base over there, they're always, you know, asking me about it or complaining one or the other. So, uh, uh, I know, I know pitchers love it, but yeah, it sometimes can be tough for hitters too. Dude, you have to be pissed because were you there before they moved I was, it? So I was there Gosh, my first year. They it was had such it, a great place it was, to hit. It was awesome. Oh my god, it was awesome. And then they moved it back. I remember seeing it for the first day. I'm like, holy crap! Like that is insane. <laughs> I'm, I'm looking back, AJ. Get one, so, at exactly. least one yeah. of three games. <laughs> AJ, how about this? Early May of 2022. Ryan had a 407 foot double to left center field that would have been a home run in any other ballpark in baseball. Uh, yep, yep, that sounds about right. <laughs> and and I'm sure Grayson Rodriguez would just be like, "Yo, lift more, yep. bro." Yeah, exactly. <laughs> literally, literally. Oh my gosh. If, if, right. No, I, I have I have a question on this on this fence topic, and then we'll drop the fence topic. Do you look at it and say, okay, starting pitching is really expensive in the free agent market, and then they go and do that? Do you feel like that's another cheap move that you're like, come on, man. Like, we got a bunch of prospects coming up here. We should bludgeon teams to death. We should win 12 to to 9, move the fences in because of the way you (laughs) built built the organization. Yeah, obviously as a hitter, you know, you want to win 12 to 9. But uh, I guess, I mean, uh, I think it's – you know, a little more appetizing to pitchers to come here now with that wall. And, um, I mean, you can still hit it over it. You just got to hit it a lot further. Farther than 400. <laughs> farther, apparently farther than 407 you only feet. You have to hit it 410. Oh, my gosh. I would never that, that's big. Dude. Yeah. Do you, All right, so now – go ahead, AJ. No, I was going to say, does your left fielder get tired running around out there? Yeah, because... he's, you know, uh, yeah he's diving and running. It's I, I would like to see how far he runs on, like, an average game. The, like they do in soccer, like you know, yeah, yeah, soccer, like it's got to be over two miles. See, because like. now you can't do the Manny Ramirez where you jumped up and caught the ball, high five the fan, yeah, yeah, and then turn around because no. you can't get you. No, you're you, not getting up there. You need like a no. repelling thing exactly. to get up the wall. <laughs> oh my goodness, Ryan, can you give me a, a scouting report on Jackson Holiday? We've been asking everyone. Our fans want to know all about him. We've gotten a couple like, oh, he's quiet. You know, he's just kind of doing his thing. He's been in the clubhouses for a while. There's got to be something he did, you know, over the past month that's either funny or you know, like, give me something. What's he doing when he's sitting in the clubhouse? Is it just like the classic, hey, I'm I'm chilling on the phone? Is he is he in on like the monopoly that you guys were playing last year? Anything unique going on there? Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, you've sort of nailed it all. He's just sort of low key, does his work, and uh, he likes playing ping pong. He seems pretty good at ping pong. I, I don't get on the table much, but from what I mean, besides that, he's just doing his own thing, laying low. They have ping pong and pool table, yeah, by the ping way, pong, pool in, table. The, in mm. the clubhouse. It's show. Yeah, that is show. That's big league. I is like it, it still the really nice ping pong table that J.J. Hardy bought years ago that has, like, yeah. pace on the table? Yeah, so he came in the other day. I've never seen somebody that good at ping pong. It's He's like ever. everything he hit was just a missile. Like, I, there's no way I was stepping on the table with that guy. The freak <laughs> at ping pong. All right, Same. everybody. Everybody always asks about Jackson Holiday. Oh, give us a scouting report. So Scotty did the Jackson Holiday Thanks, scouting Matt. report. I want to know who the biggest spread killer is on your team. You've been around a little bit. You've seen who kills the most spread. For everybody who doesn't know, that means who takes the most food out of the clubhouse and is just constantly on the ta- on the spread table. Oof. It, the funny part is, it's usually not even like most of the players. It's you know some staff that like is That's just crushing. You know what I mean? You can but, say hi Freddie. <laughs> <laughs> or Freddie. You can say Freddie. I'm trying to think. Guys on the team, I know. Oof. 
I mean, I would assume Wells. Wells is a big boy. He just walked out, by the way. Did he just walk out? Yeah, he was towering over Santander. my car. Yeah, some of the bigger guys can, can put down some food. But honestly, there's not one name that really like comes to mind, but probably some of those bigger guys. That's disappointing. Dude, they got a nice hey, red I, room, too, by the way. They got a like big black. old cafeteria. Yeah. I, I, was, I peeked in the door, and the lady yelled at me because you're not allowed to look in there. And I was like, too bad. And I peeked in there, and they had a big <laughs> old – this whole thing is a yeah. cafeteria. <laughs> Hey, Ryan, do they still have – have they redone the minor league complex for the Orioles? Because for years and, – and now you're smiling. That place was an absolute – it was baby. dangerous. Yeah. Dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I think it's – yeah, Twin Lakes. And uh, hopefully I don't have to go back there anytime soon. But <laughs> it felt like, yeah, the locker room was very, very crammed. Uh, it was like a can of sardines in there. So um, – but in the fields were always, you know – they're all right, so but yeah, I haven't been there in a while, so I don't know if they've made any. They still have it. They, the, they the still have it. Minor leagues yeah, are? yeah, a couple couple exits down they go. Over Dude, there. well, you you weren't even born yet, yeah. but the the Orioles used to have spring training at Fort Lauderdale, and their minor leagues was in Sarasota, and they'd yeah. bust dudes back and forth for the big league games. Oh my that's, what I was, that's what I was getting Sarasota to. And the other one was in Fort. That's like a four hour drive. <laughs> that's and why they had to keep the payroll low. Yeah. That's a lot of gas and tolls. Yeah. <laughs> Jeez. Well, is it how small though? Give me a comparison. Like, you, have you been to the Wrigley Fields visiting clubhouse? Yeah, it gave me uh, there. Like, Wrigley's pretty small. I know Fenway's visiting side's really small. I'd sort of like put it up with Fenway, but with probably a couple extra guys in there. So it's like you're you can't move around too much when you're changing, or else you know, <laughs> you know what's right. Gonna they still yeah, have a lot of a lot of butts and faces. Yeah, they used to yeah. have the batting cage. Like, they used to have the batting cage in the locker room. Now, did they change that? In uh, Fenway? No, in in or, uh, the oh, Orioles minor league. Twin league. Oh, Twin Lake. No, no, no. They got normal batting cages now. I think. Yeah. So they when used to have. Oh, there's one in the they, locker room. Yeah. They used to have it where you couldn't sit at your locker when dudes were hitting in the cage. <laughs> no way. I've never yeah. Heard. So. So it's upgraded. What you've seen is upgraded. Yeah, big upgrade. Imagine that. Very big upgrade. Do they yeah. still have – because I played there in Gulf Coast League. Do they still have the – it was like – first of all, it's like a park where there's like people walking around. Yeah. But the, the benches were on the ground. Like you sat on the ground. It was like a wooden seat on the ground that was like slightly tilted up, you know, in the back so your legs would go up. <laughs> and you literally climbing. sat on the ground on a piece of wood that was like this with the back. Yeah. Instead of like, I, you know, the metal benches. Yeah, these, yeah, you know? I think they've – made some upgrades we have metal benches over oh, there. oh man now, they've really gone all out yeah. over there <laughs> that, that place was hell we yeah. come up here and play and you're like oh no we oh, stopped God. playing them we stopped playing them the blue jays stopped playing the orioles at the minor league complex they would only come up to dunedin oh jeez. yeah no i think i think they've made i guess a couple upgrades from what it seems but the batting cages are probably way nicer now for sure well, they're not in the clubhouse. They're way not nice. in the clubhouse. Yeah. That's absurd. <laughs> all right, we had all right, before this is the last one, I think, and then you, we have, I have to go because I have to yeah. get to my son's game back. No, you got one more. We got to get the other side of the post game interview. We got Grayson, and then then oh, we're done. Shoot. Okay, we got it. But yes, go ahead. Last one. Well, no, I was going to say we had Eflin on yesterday, and <laughs> yeah. so he's a Haggerty guy. Haggerty guy here, right? We've had we've had Von Grisham on Haggerty guy. We had Riley Green on this spring so you guys all live close to each other still in Oviedo yeah I think Zach is more down in Tampa now yeah I think he just moved he, said he just bought a place down there yeah right? so but besides that me Riley and Vaughn all work out together hit together yeah do everything that's not a bad uh it's not a bad yeah. little trio to it's say, <laughs> it's say awesome. hey guys you want to go work out Let's yeah get, and you guys hit yeah. the high school I'm assuming yep hit at the high school and uh we have a couple other guys that come out here and there like I know Vogelbach was coming out Christian Arroyo uh, there's a couple other guys too, but no, it's it's a good little group. Well, good. Now you're warmed up and ready for post game interviews in the regular season. Hope we were helpful for your simulated post game live VP. <laughs> I appreciate it. <laughs> thanks, Ryan. Good to see you, dude. Good yeah, luck this season, all right, you guys. Yeah, thank, thank you. Appreciate you. It. Ryan Mountcastle with us uh, on FT Live. I mean, hey, Kratz. One of the things I brought up when we started putting FT together was how bad most post-game interviews are in baseball specifically. I'm not blaming broadcasters. I've been there many times. I've done it hundreds of, hundreds of times. So I'm, I'm in that club, okay? But you go on the field 
and you have five seconds and everyone asks the same five questions and it's everyone gives the same five answers. It's just mostly lame. So just trying to switch it up. So maybe I figure, you know, if guys get more practice and reps in the regular season, they can give us the real answers. Like how amazing would it be if, you know, April 10th, Ryan Mountcastle hits a homer off a dude and we're like, yo, how was that AB? And he's like, freaking double bird his ass. I don't give a fuck. <laughs> It'd be amazing. It would go viral. It would go viral. And it's not about <laughs> necessarily going viral. It's about showing who the person is. And I'm so excited that we get to talk to Grayson because one of my ideas when we first started the show was, hey, let's talk to, let's talk to Ryan Mountcastle of the Orioles and Grayson Rodriguez of the twins, they're facing off tonight, and or they're facing off tomorrow night. What would you guys say to each other because you're ex-teammates and blah, blah, blah. And then they face each other in a game. To me, it creates that, like, storyline that I'm going to watch this game. I'm not even an Orioles fan. And I want to watch because I saw an FT, Grayson, talking smack to his old buddy O'Hearn or his old buddy Ryan Mountcastle. And now they get to face each other. So I'm going to flip that game on and see what happens. That's creating the story instead of, well, I just tried my best and I wanted to do good for the team. And I'm really excited about how everybody's doing. Those are losing answers now, by the way. Okay. Winning teams have more fun. They're more relaxed. Rolling with Rock in the chat just said, I am loving how relaxed, chill, and ready the guys all seem today. These O's are ready to run the AL East and more. I would agree with that, you know? I would agree. Some teams that that are too tight, they're so calculated, every word coming out of their mouth, it's just tired. It's unnecessary. 2004. Yeah. Go ahead, Kratz. Rick Kimbrell just walked by with his his fishing gear, and he didn't recognize me. So he's – what's that, big-leaguing the shit out of me? (laughs) I was going to say, back in in 2014, we were playing the Orioles – Jeremy Guthrie had a guy who had, he had like a shirt company and they were just like, you know, something would happen in a game or something and he'd throw it on a shirt before like people were really doing that. And we beat the Orioles in a, in a, I think it was the extra inning game and he got called to the podium and he put on a shirt. If you guys remember the song, Hose Ain't Loyal, he had a shirt that said the O's Ain't Royals. And this is a dude that used to play with the Orioles, so he had friends over there. He was now with, in the playoffs, and he got so much flack for that. People were people were coming up to him. It was like somebody that tried to kind of show a little bit of their like funny side. And I get it; it might have hurt some of the Orioles players' feelings, but you know, like let that kind of stuff happen. If that's what you're about. Do that. Like, just just let you be you and not just, hey, uh, make sure you go through media training and you give the vanilla answer. I I agree. Yeah, Jeremy Guthrie is a gem. There's a lot of guys we talked to and we're like, ahead of their time. Ahead right? of their time. And even, and even that Carlos whole Gomez. team. Carlos Gomez. Yeah. Ahead of his time. Carlos Gomez. He's a showman. He was a showman. But that, that was who he was. He enjoyed the game. We had him on... The legend's territory. He enjoyed the game. And I think however you enjoy the game, make sure it's authentic, not fake, not like, oh, I saw Jazz Chisholm do this. Well, you ain't Jazz Chisholm. Like, do you. Do Eric Kratz, whatever that is. Do AJ Pruszynski. Do Scott Braun. And that's how How people connect. How about do this? Can I do it? No. Can't really see it. No. No, no, no. You do it. You do it. Here. This is what it looked like when I faced Kimbrel. Oh, gosh. Here it comes. <laughs> Here it comes. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> wow. He said, oh, I didn't know he wouldn't bring it up. I literally told him we wouldn't bring it up. You can't even let the man sit down. I didn't know he was on. You guys got to tell me this stuff. <laughs> so embarrassed. <laughs> Craig, do you know we've been trying to get you on for like over a year? Okay, your agent owes us lunch because AJ and me are in the area and we'll text him and he's like, oh, yeah, I promise next week. So and he, he gets shout outs all the time. So you need to call him out so that he, he actually takes us out to lunch. And AJ is going to make right. it a nice, I'll, 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 nice I'll fancy steak lunch. Thank well, I'm you. I'm here now. I got I got stopped from going and 
catching some fish. Where so. are you catching fish? Not, oh, the pond. pond. Yeah, yeah. Pond. yeah. See, see that body of pond? see that body of water? It's got fish in it. Big fish. <laughs> They're all right. <laughs> Gets the you job know, done. So what's your body water about like two miles that way? Yeah, I don't. I don't mess with the ocean. Yeah, I get seasick. So. <laughs> Craig, take me through your day today. Like, what, what's your average day like today? Because you, you look like you just had a fantastic morning. Oh, yeah, it was great. Uh, coming in off an off day, I came in, played a little catch, and uh, got the body loose. I'm getting ready uh, getting ready for my back-to-back so I can be ready for the season. All right, so I got to ask, because the, the, the spring training we were together in Atlanta right before they traded you to San Diego, you came in and you said, I'm going to work on a change-up this year. So mm-hmm. I'm going to throw change-ups in spring training. So are you working on a change-up this spring training? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, I'm still I'm still working on it. I don't, I've been working on it ever since I was about 12 years old and haven't mastered it yet. So <laughs> maybe, uh, maybe to come one of these days. <laughs> <laughs> that could be crazy, though, actually. Like at some point mm-hmm. in your career – You'll just suddenly have this elite change of and they'll be like, new pitcher. He's got five five more years left on him. How, how many years left do you want to pitch? As many years as they still they let me come out and grab the ball and try to get out. I'm gonna keep on Are you trying. one of those though? Like, do you want to pitch until you're, you know, forty four years old or something crazy? Like, yeah, who's the one who said Verlander's like forty five? He like says the number. I don't have a number. I think uh I think the guys in the box and let me know when I need to go home. So I'll uh, I'm gonna keep keep slinging it until that happens. I right, fastballs and curveballs. Those those things work, by the way. 95 right here, curveballs down here on the same angle. Scott yeah, hey, don't forget one. about the changeup. That's right. Oh, and the new changeup. <laughs> he's got the new death ball. He's calling it. True, true. Hey, Craig, when you got the call from Baltimore, what was your thought? Like, did you get a recruiting call at some point early in the off season? I mean, I, the first phone call was it was a perfect fit. Um, you know, this this is a great team. Uh, had uh, had an opening, um, unfortunately, um, but uh, news is a, a huge possibility. And uh, somewhere, you know, when we got the phone call that I wanted to come, and it, it took a couple of weeks, but we made it happen. And here I am. Um, it's a great, great group of guys. Um, we got a couple of veterans on this team. It's uh, you know, team more of guys that have you know are young and. Um, you know, still, still figuring it out, you know, uh, but, but very talented and, uh, you know, being around a lot of guys, uh, this young, it definitely, definitely makes me feel a little bit older, but at the same time, it's, uh, it's a lot of fun. You better at fishing or golfing? Um, I don't think I'm good at either one of them, but I sure like it. (laughs) Which one do you do more of? Uh, I definitely fish more. Um, you know, I live on some land back in Tennessee, and we got a couple ponds we like to fish on. I grew up fishing, and uh, my daughter, she uh, every time we see a body of water, she wants to throw throw a line in and try to catch something. So um, definitely, I gravitate towards getting in a, getting in the boat, having a fishing pole in our hands, and um, it's just you it's know, just a lot of good times. And it's not even fair because you know you stock those ponds so bad that every time you throw a line in. A fish is biting, so that's why your daughter wants to go fishing. Yeah, I mean her, that's like, real fish. I mean that's the problem with taking her fishing somewhere other than home is if we don't catch one every third cast, she she gets bored and she says the fish aren't biting. And so, uh, you know, I, I do my best, but you know, it's fishing, it's not catching. That's right, that's right. It's like when they people say you went hunting, you didn't get none. I'm like, it's hunting, it ain't catching. Hey, Craig, on the on that call you had with Baltimore because we were talking about this earlier, were they like? Hey, I know you strike a lot of dudes out, but if you give up that occasional fly ball to left center field, good chance it's getting caught because we made our left center field impossible for hitters. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was definitely it was definitely part of, of the phone call. Um, you know, I haven't had an opportunity to pitch uh, in, in Camden Yard since they moved the fence. You know, last time I was there, you didn't want the ball to be put in play. So uh, having that out in left field is definitely going to be a plus. Dude, how many teams is this for you? It's number eight. God, you beat me! Damn, eight teams. Number eight. Damn, man, you, you're like you're like the grizzled veteran now, right? So, and on this team, you mentioned how young these guys are. Guess what? You're playing for free this year because you're buying every dinner. That's okay. That's fine. All right. Yeah. Just, just letting you know that every one of these dudes is coming up to you like, "Hey, Dirty Craig, like a uh, dinner," and you're like, "Oh man, I got to pay again." Yeah, that's fine. I mean, with this group of guys, I, I'm sure here in a couple of years, I can show up and I can have them take me to dinner, no problem. <laughs> yep. 
that's a great plan. You pay for dinner this year, the rest of your life, these dudes will be paying. You'll see Adley, you'll see Adley 10 years from now. He'll be like, oh, yo, Greg, let's go, let's go out to eat. And you're like, <laughs> bring all the whole family, bring everybody. <laughs> the daughter's boyfriend, everybody, everybody's coming out. Yeah, I don't, I don't um, want to think about that too much. <laughs> <laughs> I, I got one more because I, I, I get Craig on an interview every few years, all right? And I remind him because this is like my early career days in MLB. I just sent it to AJ. Do you remember our, our connection oh. from, what was it, 14 years ago or some crap? No, maybe a little less than that. Maybe like 10, 11 years ago. But uh, yeah. I just, you know, I get a call and they're like, hey, we need you to um, – call a, an event i was like oh what game and they were like it's a craig kimbrell staring contest in new york mm -hmm. city mlb fan yeah, yeah i know I, I remember that I, I showed up not knowing what to expect and got thrown into an extremely awkward situation did you win yes. stare at strangers in the eyes i'm pretty sure i won yeah <laughs> yeah he, he dominated no, I didn't. Dude, you got to watch the video. AJ, you'll like it. I look I look okay. nine. I, I actually, I look probably like uh, Jackson Holiday baby face action there. Oh, wow. So at some point, check out the video. It's it's pretty well, good, you, but it look, is true. If you look nine, I probably look 10. <laughs> yeah, it was early career. What? So they brought him in and they're just like, yo, we're going to bring in random strangers from New York City and you're going to have a staring match with them. And whoever blinks loses. Wow. True story. All right. We're very creative in MLB. And look where we are uh, better, now. Um, before he goes, better hair, him or Kramer? Ooh. Ooh. Well, Kramer's got better hair. I, I can go ahead and tell that. He wears his down. I pull mine up. Always. Always. Man, he pulled his down today. It was that slow. Was, yeah. Hey, I'll pull mine down for a minute. I don't see how long it yeah. is. Yeah. Let's see. Where are we at? His is like a drain clogger. Let's see. Oh, is that a rat deal? This. Is that, that's a mullet. That's, mm -hmm. that's like a full Tennessee mullet. Shave the sides? Is it shade? Is, who's got, no. I got a do-rag on, so. Ah, uh, okay. All right. It's just like one strand of hair. Like Kramer Besides came out. Height, though? Let me see this. Where are we at? Well, we, well he's about to lose his earpiece, but that's, that's all right. That's, that's okay. Right. Hold the hat. This, this is the visual portion of the interview. All right. There we go. Okay. pretty good. You know, oh, you, yeah, look like, you look like a professional wrestler. All right, let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Craig, next real, to the real quick wrestling for me, fan. and maybe and maybe you don't even care about this. Are you a Hall of Famer? I ask guys. Uh, I ask guys this. You know, I, I don't. I'm a, I'm a. I'm a. I'm a player. I don't get that vote. So that's up for that's up for uh, for the riders to decide. Do you want to be a Hall of Famer? Like, is that like, cause you, you no, love, no, you love not, just it's not something that makes me show up every day. So, yeah. I mean, it's an honor to just be, be in that conversation. Uh, it means I've been able to do some great things in my career, but it's not what pushes me. It's not what makes me want to show up every day. So uh, it, it really, it really doesn't matter to me. You're I mean, a hall of famer in my book. Pal. Well, I appreciate that. Yeah. I don't care what, I don't care what the home rough you want. Yeah. Oh, two yeah. off the bleachers. I couldn't even turn around before it hit them. Really spring training and a, real and a double in triple no, a but no, that matters no it was it was a real homer uh -huh. it was it was like strike out the first two guys on six pitches and then get him 0-2 and then he put it in the bleachers and we played extras so it was one of those kind of homers yeah we we won we won an extras i actually wasn't supposed to face you i was facing o'flaherty and juan pierre got thrown out stealing so then they brought kimberl into kimberl in the ninth and I whacked it, but I did hit a double off the wall in Triple A. But that's when you were tipping, so that was before you made the show. <laughs> well, I appreciate that. Oh, yeah. Man. Well, well, Craig, just you—you you made his life. Okay, it's on his resume. Um, he uses it whenever he applies to any jobs. So, thank you for that. <laughs> Not a problem at all. <laughs> Craig, good to see you, dude. Enjoy the rest hey. of the day. All right. Thanks for swinging by. I appreciate it, guys. Thank you, Craig Kimber, with us from Sarasota. Uh, we're getting we're getting all the action there. Um, all right, yeah, we're we're probably gonna probably gonna say so long, man. We're going extra innings, hardcore, the last couple of days. I like it. Um, I think we're gonna have to wait. Yeah, exactly. We are in the twelfth inning for the Cubs. Which, by the way. We're just about ready to put a lid on the offseason finally. There's a few teams that, that came up a bit short, you know?
Because you could look at it on the Farhan Zaidi uh, area of saying, oh, we're done, but then we're not done. Surprise. Love you, fans. Or you can look at it the other way and be like, well, we're not done. There's still free agents out there. And then all of a sudden you blink and it's like the season started and everyone forgets and no one asks you the questions anymore, right? Like, I mean, I know the Angels picked up some relievers, but you know, Mike Trout was like, hey, can we get some help here? Some other dudes besides relief pitchers? Um, I think they're just going to go into the season and have a good time. All right, we'll so let's bring... Yeah, we'll see what happens. Let's bring AJ back and we'll go to slap hands and call it a day. And because I got to get home too. Sorry, yeah, we're trying to see if Grayson's still here to defend his honor. Okay. Otherwise, we'll get him during the season. Just tell them we'll get him. We'll get him in a couple weeks. Yeah, well, he's the PR guy's checking right now, so uh, he literally ran in to see because we got to get him here to defend his honor. But you know, I got a four o'clock game. I got to get home too. So uh, snip, snip, chop, chop, boys. Yeah, yeah, we're we're pushing. But I mean, we do, listen. Point. It's not every day. Honestly, Craig Kimbrell is probably a Hall of Fame closer. It's not every day he walks by, and you're like, "Hey, Craig," and he's like, "Oh man," but he did it. He was, <laughs> he's like, "Damn it, they caught me." Said, Kratz is gonna Kratz is gonna bring up his homers and ask about my Hall said, of Fame. First, no. First thing he said was, "Is Kratz gonna bring up the homer he hit off me?" And I'm like, "No, he won't." No do way. That. He, earpiece in, and Kratz is already talking about his homer. No did way. He really? Did he really say I that swear. though? Or are you kidding? I, I, dude, you gotta ask. You gotta ask the, the guys that are here with me. He literally sitting down. He's like, I go, you know, Kratz, right? And he goes, Yeah, he hit a home run. Me, I hope you don't bring it up. And then as what? he's putting his headphone in, it literally, I go, He's talked about it before. He's like, I hope he didn't bring it up today. Boom. And Kratz is like, I hit a home run from once. That's not look. Look, I hit home runs off of twenty nine different people in the big leagues. I am gonna talk about it. And if I hit two <laughs> off you in the minor leagues, we are definitely talking about it. Because they mattered to me, and they are so much fun. I didn't have I didn't have 178 home runs to forget who all I hit him against, but I'll let him I'll let him not forget. Uh, that's great. Did, I love. Did it. you hit a homer off off or two homers off any one pitcher? Yeah, in the bigs. Yeah, Boom. Mike Mike Leak and Mitchell Boggs. Nice. Wow. I think I I think I ended Mitchell Boggs' career. He had like a one eight. ERA and I hit a homer off him. It was like the second homer he gave up the whole year. And it was a first pitch, first pitch three run homer. And then the season ended. Next season they came early in the season. It was cold in Philly. He comes in, one run game, three run homer, second pitch. Two homers. I think it was two, two, three run homers. But it was two first pitches. And then Mitchell Boggs was like, if I'm giving up home runs to this guy, I'm out. Well, you know how there's there's confidence outings? Like, what was it, 2021, Kyle Wright comes in for like an inning or two and just blows everyone away, and then he pitched some meaningful innings for the Braves in the World Series soon after that, and they're like, man, he needed that that confidence of coming in for an inning, just striking out the side or whatever the hell he did. There could be the reverse where they're like, Mitch Boggs was tearing up the big leagues, and then he gave up a home run to Kratz, and he was like, I don't think I'm that good. And it yeah, was all downhill no, I- from there. I, de- I had a theory, and I know we got to let AJ go, but my theory was yeah. if you're in the big leagues and you give up a home run to me, they're going to probably transition you to the minor leagues or relieving. And if you're in the minor leagues, they're probably taking you off the roster. It was a whole cycle of stuff. So just don't give up a home run to me. And let's have that. Careful. We did it. Thank you to the Orioles for setting us up with many great interviews. And thanks to the Orioles for just being chill and cool. They were good. Very relatable. I love it. It seems like a lot of the guys that have either been there for a while feel like they're vets, even if they're like 27 years old. And there's a lot of dudes that were rookies like Gunnar Henderson last year, even just like getting used to the interviews and all that. So good stuff. That was fun. Um, AJ, you're coming back tomorrow. So we'll see you in a normal studio. No sunshine, no, no sunscreen, no bug spray. Yeah, no caterpillars. Um, just want to say mm-hmm. thank you to. Well, we have one more, I guess. We have the Pirates on next week. Um, yeah, for spring training tour. But thank you to every team that helped us out. I mean, most most of the teams were incredible. Uh, they helped us out most. hugely doing these. And you know, it's still it, it never. I don't know. And Kratz can speak on this maybe a little bit too. It's never not awkward for me to walk into a clubhouse 
as a former player and now as a media person to try to talk to these guys. But all these teams have been overwhelmingly accommodating. I don't even know if that's the right wordage, but they have been unbelievably accommodating, helping us, setting us up, getting guys to come out. Uh, and guys are saying yes when I ask them or when they're PR people. So thank you to everyone that we've had on this spring. I know it's not over yet, but I, I just got it from seriously from the bottom of my heart. Thank you to the PR teams, the people that work behind the scenes, our interns that have been here with us, grinding through it, and, and all the players that have said yes, and, and the front office people, and even you know the managers and coaches we've had on. They've all been absolutely amazing. Yeah, agreed. And also now, even for your Fox games, you're going to be like, yeah, I know this guy. I know this guy. I was hanging out with this guy. You're going to have so much name dropping all year because you've already hung oh. out with like half the league. Um, oh. All right. So so lastly here, uh, Kratz hats. Yeah. And I think the Orioles being able to do this really well shows that the game's in a good spot because we can sell the game by showing personalities. And the Orioles are one of the better teams right now and the youngest team right now. Columbus Clippers, ring your bells. It's the old alt hat. Solid blue, but the you can see the ship right there. The ship yeah. in the video before the games would always blow up and blow up other ships. So, Like a kamikaze ship? Yeah, it was like a – it was the same video for years at the new stadium, Huntington Park. I always remember when I would go to the Somerset games growing up and they'd say – is this heaven? No, it's Somerset. <laughs> Man, this video is it was a Said classic on the ever. old camcorder. Yeah. Uh, all right. We'll see everyone bright and early tomorrow for the Dodgers Padres post game show. Real baseball in like a few hours. So can't wait for that. And then our normal show and big announcement coming up on Thursday. New team member. Um, and we already know Ken's show is going to be live. 12.30 Eastern following our show that starts at 11 on Thursday. So a lot of cool announcements. We'll see everyone on Wednesday.